In this ever-changing, chaotic world that we live in, there is one thing that remains the same, and it is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Live from Delray Beach, Florida, this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Shout out Sunday. I hope everyone is well out there. Uh, what's going on? What's happening, RS70? What's going on in London? John, hope you're well. Hey, Darren. Listen, it, it's, not, it, it, it's the old look, you know, and, 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 and all, our, all, our old friends are, all our friends are here, too. Everybody's here. Down in down in Arnie, down in Arnie Stone's kitchen in uh, in Florida, you know. Of course, of course, I'm doing my show now, so that's the signal for everybody to blow up my phone, inclu- including family members. Uh, what's up, Gary? How are you, man? What's happening in Northern Ireland? How's the weather in Northern Ireland? You know, Debo, come on, Debo, the pro, New York hardcore comics. You know what? I gotta say, I, I, you know what? Let me tell you something about New, about Debo the Pro, New York Hardcore Comics. Open. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna straight up ad lib this. Let's see by now if I don't know this. Yo, New York Hardcore Comics opened back in 2013 when lifelong friends Debo the Pro and Lee Fairley com- combined their collections and obsessions for comic books, punk rock, toys, statues, magic, The Gathering, and all things horror. The store is located at 117 Main Street in lovely Dobbs Ferry, New York. Open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Contact them by email at www.newyorkhardcorecomics.com or at www.newyorkhardcorecomics.com. There you go. I'm coming up to do a commercial, Debo. We're going to be coming up that way. We, we like doing – yeah, I'm in Florida. I'm, I'm at Arnie's in Florida, and uh, we survived the hurricane. And uh, Arnie's going in for hip replacement surgery tomorrow. So we wish, uh, yeah, it's tomorrow. Yep. Another hip. Second hip. Hip, hip, hooray. Right? All you hipsters. Melanie Reinhardt from Arizona to now MT watching, waiting on Troy Boy. What's MT? What's MT? Is that a state? I don't know. What's it? Montana? Is MT Montana? the fuck you doing in Montana? Is Montana even a place? Does everything exist? That's crazy. Ah, Montana it is. Well, yeehaw. Montana. Yeah, let's move to Montana. Where in Montana would you be? Like, what's Montana? MT equals Montana. Ooh. Easy. What's the capital of Montana? I did. What is the capital of Montana? I do not know. Larry Kelly's moving there soon. You better not, bro. What's the capital of Montana, somebody? Helena. Is that right? Helena is the cop- capital of Montana. I would never have known that. What's happening in Phoenix? Speaking of Montana, what's happening in the Lower East Side of New York right now? Stephen J. Montana here. <laughs> I am at C-Squad right now. I'm here for week three of the Worldwide Hardcore Firing Squad uh, photo exhibition. And uh, behind me, you can see Rich Zoller is right there. And uh, Tim Do- Tim Daly's not here yet, but uh, this has been a, an awesome thing. And we're here. So we're here from two to five today. And next week is the last week. It is uh, the closing Saturday from two to five again. But uh, it's been awesome. These people are great, and they've been doing a wonderful job here. Yeah, that's my man Bill Cashman, right? Yeah, actually, there's Bill Cashman right behind me. Bill Smashman. Yo, Bill, what's up? He can't hear because of the Bluetooth, but I told him to wave. Bill Bill Smashman. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So 
Let's Good. do a photo of the day. Well, wait, let me put up the. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me yes, put up do that. The fly. And the show's going on through when? Uh, today till five. And then Saturday is the final day from two to five next Saturday, the closing. There it is. Listen, I'll vouch. Listen. I'll vouch for this show, and not just because there's three photos of me up on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, man. It's a great show, you know. Yes, and it, it really, you know what? It's great to see all of our friends uh, been coming down and supporting us and the bands, and uh, very cool. We appreciate we have, it. We have friends. They say they like us. Yeah, people like. They us. only like me because I know you. No. <laughs> they always say hello to you. None of them say hello to me in public. Yeah. They're afraid of you. They fear you. <laughs> Come to the dark side. <laughs> All right, here we go. Photo of the day, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Photo of the day, wrong answers only. I'm going to mute you. You're getting muted, B. All right, photo of the day. Wrong answers only, please. Let's start with this. Yeah, let's start with this. Wrong answers only, please. Here we go. Is it? And I, I apologize that I'm not doing full screen on some of these. Right, and uh, you had mentioned that you had issues. Technically, I'm a little so. challenged here in, in, in Florida, in Delray Beach, Florida. You know? That's all right. That's all right. Is it? Is it Queen? Is it Motley Crue? <laughs> is it Love Your Shows from Canada, from Canada, Toronto? Hey, Jimmy Amaral. Well, thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Really appreciate everybody up in Canada that watches the show and enjoys it. Is it posing for a crew? That is sort of a no, Nikki Six pose that dude's doing. Yeah, he has a little of that going on for sure. Is it Steve Harris on bass, Steve Vai on guitar? <laughs> is it not not to not not to re not to regress a little bit, but moving to Montana soon, <laughs> gonna be a dental floss tycoon. Yippee! <laughs> today's you know we'll, we'll get a little zap it we'll get a little zap it in the mix today, today today's today's secret word is montana so there you go. Here's, here's another shot there's another shot is it these amps go back is it nickelback reunion is it johnny depp on get to, oh this is okay and we have a winner is it bucky in the dense that's a good one yeah. Yeah, tell them in back to shut up. Loud? Shut the fuck up. That's okay. Um, is it the hipster barbershop boys? <laughs> is it Buddy Holly? I thought Buddy Holly was dead. That's just a rumor. Where did Buddy Holly's plane crash? And don't tell me it was Montana. Oh, that's a good question. The day the music died. And they were singing bye bye, Miss Young. And who were the other two? Who were the other two people? Who, who, Richie you know. Valens and the Big Bopper. There you go. Good. Don't Classic. fuck with the, Don't fuck with the God of Rock trivia. He will crush you. <laughs> uh, oh, SD. Would that be South Dakota? Hmm. South Dakota. Okay, fair enough. Listen, you know what? I got to say this. While, while we're in the groove of sort of, you know, artists I can't stand, Billy Joel, Styx. And, and you know what? The dude that sings, and they were singing bye bye. Yo, yo, fuck that. I hope I never hear that song again. And also that motherfucker that sings, and the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Yo, if I ever hear that again, someone, I'm going to go on a rampage like, like Lou Ferrigno. I'm rampaging like Lou Ferrigno. Where did you go? 
Well, so Don McLean and Harry Chapin are on your shit list. Don McLean, that's it. Don <laughs> McLean, that's who it is. Well, Harry Chapin, he's, he's dead, so he's safe. Harry Chapin, Harry, wait, Harry Chapin didn't. Harry Chapin didn't do Cats in the Cradle. Wasn't no, he that, did Cats um, in the Cradle. Sure, he did. Wasn't that um? That that was Stevens. Harry, nope, that was Harry Chapin. What's yo? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna cut. You, you know what? Fuck photo of the day, right? For, <laughs> for a second. Okay. <laughs> I'm going off here, right? Fuck photo of the day for a second. I'm not mad at Harry Chapin. Sadly, he passed on the LIE. You know that, right? That's yes. right. That's right. So he gets a, he gets a pass. Who, who, what's what's the Cat Stevens I can't stand? Wild World. Oh baby, baby, it's a, yo. Fuck that. Wow. You're not big on singer songwriters. Yo, Don McLean rocks. He's from New Rochelle. Drew already has a Rochelle. Harry Chapin was a good man, right? You know what? That's funny you should say that. He's from New Rochelle. I have a Rochelle. I don't know if That's she's right. a New Rochelle, but... She's Rush, Rochelle 2.0. Wow. You know, Billy, Billy Pilgrim Johnson's coming down on me because of, of, of the Don McLean. See that? Yeah, here you go. Fuck storyteller guitar dudes, bro. You know? Hey, you know uh, wow. the Harry, Yo, I'm not mad at Harry Chapin. Harry Chapin's get Harry Chapin's not not like not. My wrath does not include Harry Chapin today. You, All right, I photo really of the day. What's going anybody. on? Photo of the day. Who are these guys? All right, we are looking at Kill Code right there. Who are uh, Kill Code? That is Kill Code. Okay. And uh, these guys are, I would call them one of the biggest cult bands like in our area, like they've been around a long time. They're managed by a, a guy named Danny Stanton, who we know who works with Kiss and Twisted Sister. And their album is produced by our good friend, Joey Z from Life of Agony. And uh, always put on a great show. They kind of walk the line between like metal and a little bit of heavier stuff at times. And they're very cool, you know, and they were fun. I saw them last night, in fact. Should I mention who I saw them with? But, yeah, go uh, ahead. Sure. They opened Mentioned. up for prong last night, just by well, coincidence. I was, we'll I was be, out. We'll shooting. be talking, and we'll be talking a little prong today. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And uh, actually, while I mentioned Joey Z, I got a shout out. Uh, happy birthday to Alan Robert today. That's right, our buddy, our, our buddy, uh, our buddy Alan Robert from Life of Agony. Yeah. Spoiler NYC. He's going to be coming to the Barry Electric. You know what? Why don't? Why don't? No, I don't want to go there. Yeah, you know what? Don't go there yet. Let's not go there yet. What other singer? What other sing? What other singer songwriters can I just rail on today? James Taylor. Have you seen Fire and Rain? Yo, Bill, yo, Billy Pilgrim Johnson is waving. No, no, waving. The, 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 the Don McLean flag, you waving, bro? I just heard a cool thing about him on the radio. There's a documentary about the legacy of that song and all the people who covered it. I'm here to listen to the talk about, listen, if you want to get to, we're going to get to the talk about prong, but you have to listen to me rip on a couple singer songwriters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. I'll talk to you later, man. See say, you say, hey, say hi to everybody over there down in the, in the basement of C-Squad. I definitely will. All right. Talk See to you soon. Well, there you have it. Enough goofiness. All right. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, Grunge and Grime Soap Company, DeWolf Publishing, and 126 Hardcore Clothing. It's a streetwear brand for restless individuals who don't compromise like you, my friend. They are about being positive, spontaneous, and true to yourself for years. They experimented with several printing methods and materials and collaborated with a large number of designers and illustrators, always giving room for fresh perspectives while retaining the hardcore attitude. Don't care what you may say. We got that attitude. Get in touch with them and ramp up your game at www.126hardcoreclothing.com. Come on now, DeWolf Publishing. It's a completely independent publishing house formed by authors Amy Yates Wolfing and Stephen D. Lodovico in Philadelphia in 2014. To date, they've released five books on widely ranging topics, including graffiti culture, American scone, and reggae, 
punk zine culture, and the soon-to-be-published memoir of Adrenaline OD. Their mission is to preserve and curate subculture in its history, get your face out of that iPhone or that Android, and into a book at www.thewolfpublishing.com. That said, let's clear the deck. What the heck? Let's bring our guest on. It is Shout Out Sunday today, just so you know. Shout out to Testament, Exodus, and Death Angel on tour. Good shout out there, Michael. That's it. That's, you know, shout out. That's, 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 that's a bill right there. Testament, Exodus, and Death Angel. Yeah. Yep. Shout out to Ray Hogan. The one, the only Ray Hogan. All right. Here we go. Let's clear the deck. Here we go. <laughs> yes. Here we go, Melanie. Here we go. Nice and calm today down here in Florida. No, no sudden moves, all right? Today's guest is a musician, filmmaker, and film composer hailing from the great state of Michigan, the Great Lake state of Michigan. As a musician, in his incredibly proficient career, he is known for his work with Flotsam and Jetsam, Killing Joke, Swans, Crime, and the City Solution, Prong, Kim Foley, Denise James, and currently... The Witches and the Dirt Bombs. Please welcome, coming at us from Detroit Rock City, Michigan, Mr. Troy Gregory. What's up, man? Hi. How you doing? I'm okay, thanks. I, I found a tarot deck. It was in the closet underneath a bunch of things. Just in oh, what, 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 Sorry about that. That's a good way to kick it off. <laughs> how, how, how are you where you're at with all the weather and everything? It's been okay. Um, we, we missed we missed the, the 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 initial blast, but we were on the perimeter. Uh, a, a tornado touched down that pretty much across the street and threw a couple cars around. But Do you have a uh, basement? Uh, no, no, we're we're in a, actually in a we're on the seventh floor of an apartment building. Actually. Oh, fuck sickles! But it was, it was okay. It, it was okay. We we you could curse on the show. We 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 had, we we pulled the shutters and 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 we uh, we got through it. It it it, it was fine, you know. Uh, well, I'm glad that's, that's yeah, yeah. How are you doing? How's how's things in Detroit? It's nice. It's a nice day today. It's uh, actually the sky's really blue, and you know, it's just a slight autumn chill, but the uh, leaves are starting to change. And do you live nice. in this in in like the city, or are you on the outskirts? I'm kind of on the outskirts. I'm just just like off the freeway, um, by the zoo, by the Detroit Zoo. Yeah, now I'm just like these little <laughs> townhouses renting. Billy Pilgrim Johnson says, what's up, Troy? Good to see and hear after so long. Oh, yeah. Great. Hello, Bill. Yeah. Yes. You know, and all, and all our Detroit people are, are, are checking in today, you know? There's so many people I haven't seen in so long. So many. I always say that most people I've known throughout my life, it's almost been like, you know, people you meet on vacation. That yeah. You get along with really well, and then you most likely never see again, but you still remember them, obviously. Sure. Yeah, what, one cool thing about this show and, and this this um, technology that is evil 90% of the time, but in this particular context, it's kind of great because it connects us with people that we've seen from around the world and it gives us a chance to reconnect with them. Yeah, I got to do that enough. I don't even, I don't, yeah, I don't call, I don't call people, I'm better writing people back and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a horrible correspondence friend. You're, you're, I, you're, I you're right. You're 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 a musician. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So so how did how did you come up? Uh, did you grow up in a musical household? Set the table for us. Um, no, no one really played. But my, well, my mom played clarinet in high school. But my mom used to go to all the rock shows. Uh, she lived in River Rouge. If you ever drove into Detroit, when you come in on the gas works all under the freeway there, where it's just like which feels just like, smells like home when I get there, uh, smelling all that poison. My mom was Miss River Rouge one year. Um, oh, was, she, that, was that was that a thing, Miss River Rouge? Miss River Rouge, yes. But she used to go to all the rock shows. She saw Jerry Lee Lewis, and you know she was at the opening. The girl can't help it. With, you know, it's a little Richard James Manfield with the thing. She met Roy Orbison on the Bablo Bo Bablo Island was this um, amusement park that used to be in Detroit, kind of well on the water in between Detroit and Canada. Bands used to perform there. So she had she even ran the fan club for for some kind of almost like a. Eighth rate Bobby Rydell, a guy named Dick. I hate to say it, this guy I've ever heard. I don't know if he's still alive. A guy named Dick Caruso out of Queens, I think. And it's weird because the guy's mom wanted my mom to move out there and run his fan club. It's a good thing she did because she met my dad. 
um, and didn't. But uh, so she had a lot of records, and all her records were, you know, addressed to her. So she was like a mail list for all her Motown albums or in records, which are mostly 45s. Sure. So from her was that, and like stuff like you know, like Danny and the Juniors. Um, uh, her favorite growing up was um, Ricky Nelson. So she hadn't even autographed Ricky Nelson's first record, which probably worth something, but it meant something more to my mom. You know, she, she's not open on eBay. Um, so she had all that. Mom had that rock and roll stuff. And I started listening to the 45s in the house at a very early age. I mean, like three. I think that was the first thing I learned to use. And our stereo had 33, 45, um, you know, 16, 33, 45, and 78. So every record, especially as a kid, you know, you played at every yeah, speed. Yeah. So eventually, years later, when I saw like, the DJs, so I thought, oh, fuck, I was doing that one before. You know, playing them backwards, backwards and stuff. So it's that um, from mom. Dad, uh, he saw Clockwork Orange, and he loved the soundtrack so much that he used to play the Clockwork Orange soundtrack a lot. So... I grew up with that, and still, uh, my favorite versions of, of of the Rossini and everything like that are the electronic uh, Wendy Carlos versions. And I've always we'd look at the pictures of the record. And so eventually, it took me. I think when I was like fourteen, it was on on TV, and I finally got to see it. You know, as mm. but that with that, and he played like Man of La Mancha, and then he got like really into the Beatles. He, well, he got more into the Beatles because we loved it and stuff. But the biggest thing. Um, and I actually have it here. And an uncle that um, that died at early, I was just turning four, and he was only 28, died of an asthma attack. I was saying my mom came from that very polluted part of Detroit. And a, and a lot of the regulations around that time, too, were not as strict. You know, they were letting people just fucking get this shit, you know, asthma and stuff like that. So he had an asthma attack. Anyways, he played guitar, and I have it right here. This was one of the things Ooh. that ended up in our house. It's an nice. old airline. Wow. Which, um, it, and this is um, interesting wow, enough. Look, I, I, wow, look at, look at that. Interesting enough, I called up the guy in the airline or I wrote them and I, I wanted to get these, uh, something worked on it. And I thought these were lit up. My mom always told me these lit up, but they don't. And the guy's like, we never made one like that. So my uncle, I guess, put these little Kodak lights on it just for whatever. I don't know if they ever lit up or not. But anyways, this was down in the basement and I used to just go down and stare at it. And then also Uncle Pat's records also, strange thing, we look a lot alike. And so at his funeral, you know, everyone, oh my God, he looks so much like, you look like that guy, you know. And my really strong memories were funerals. It was born around that time where a lot of people were dying off. But I remember playing with the in the ashtray, uh, you know, sand. Um, when I was a kid, when I was still that small with it. But back to Uncle Pat, because this is a big kind of deal. His records were all like, were all over the place. So Dwayne Eddy and the Safaris and everything, and like Beatles, Stones, um, Jimi Hendrix, you know, at Access Boulder's Love and Are You Experienced. So about four or five, I started listening. And right when I started listening to Hendrix, is when he died, and my dad told me he died. And I was put on Are You Experienced. And I must have been four or five years old. And I never listened to the whole record when I got that part of like it was either that or no, it was, if six was not enough of Access Boulder's Love. That, that's that's when where was, that's where my mind went to. If when six, all of a sudden I when come when out. He, I didn't speak with that. I don't know what's got that was that for me. That and it scared the fuck out of me. I was like, holy yeah. shit, it's totally spooked out. So, so, so those in, records, yeah. In in doing uh my homework, um, I have a quote uh, uh that that I lifted of yours um in, in a great interview that you did um for um uh, uh no echo that Carlos Ramirez did. Um mm -hmm. really good, and and I complimented Carlos on it, but and I quote. Uh, by the age of three, I figured out how to use the record player. I became so obsessed with music at such an early age that genres didn't and still don't exist to me. Only music that gets my inner attention or not. Music was personal and not a social or cultural thing for me. So the landscape was wide open, still is. The Beatles music was all over the place in musical fields, and I believe that had a massive impact on me because I love them so much. And, and, and I love that, bro. That's great. I think, well, I always thought, I thought when, you know, as you was a kid too, you, you know, you're not really hip to what that's going on. You know, you don't have right. that social kind of thing with it. it. It was a thing you got on your own. And it was like, in, it was like monster movies. You know, you have like Godzilla week and stuff like that. Sure. Planet of the Apes, all these things, along with the television around that time, especially aimed at rock music. You know, you had, um, or very psychedelic, like, uh, Sid and Marty Croft, H.R. Huff and stuff, and Lidsville. Um, 
all the all the band all the rock cartoon bands all had or all, all had all the cartoon characters all had bands you know sure. not just the archies had you had uh Charlie Chan and the Charlie Chan clan you had Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kids you know the Bugaloos and and I loved all the banana splits 45s my mom ordered for me <laughs> off of the off of uh, the box yeah There's still some of my favorites the witches have actually been covered I enjoy being a boy from uh, that and it's a great those are great records because you've yeah, got yeah. Um, Barry White was the staff producer on them and is so that got, right? Yeah. And I did not know he, that. He was staff producer at Delphi at the time. So you got all these cats wow. like Al Blaine. And it's great because if you look at that whole genre of bubblegum, you know, here they're, they're going to have to make what for children, but take the idea of like some about getting high or sexual and change it around. Like obviously your Ohio players have yummy, yummy, sugar, sugar, all that's obviously very sexual. But then you have like, you know, getting the high, uh, and, you know, whatever, and different things. Yeah. Just, Totally. Just to make it feel good, you're gonna want to roller coaster. You're gonna feel so, high. So, did, did you? Did you? Uh, uh, was the guitar the first instrument that you picked up, or uh, uh, or was the bass, or or what? Both, what that was at first was just going on and this, you know, banging on it like a kid, you know, does, you know. Yeah. And then then I had like this Mickey Mouse drum set where they had like the little paper tops, and of course sure. Bobby Brady, Bobby Brady did it the first time and broke it. Sure. And then I had this acoustic, and I just screwed around on it. Let's do those guitars by. Bass, for some reason, I used to go to these in the mall, the Grinnells, and I just look at the instruments and just, you know, so, and especially I had a thing for the SGs, the double cutaway, sure. uh, Tony Anomie. But one thing, what the thing that really changed the first band I started getting onto on my own that was custom made for me, basically, in second grade was Kiss. Now, they were, it was pretty much when Dress the Kill came out. And I have to admit, the Kiss. Kiss and Devo, and for particular reasons, and I'll get to Devo later about this, but uh, are had such massive impacts on me in, in this way. Not necessarily, like, oh, they get my favorite band this time. But when I got into Kiss again, I was already into monster movies. I was already into rock and roll, comic books, Marvel, in DC, everything. So Kiss was just right up my alley. But when I saw the record Dress to Kill in the record store, I remember thinking, you know, when records, you just love records in the grocery stores, even you know, at the time then. Mm-hmm. And I thought Dress to Kill was a play on the makeup. I thought the mm. suits, they wore suits, like, you know, monkeys wore suits, you know, some of that, oh. you know, a lot of monkeys, <laughs> some of that. You, you, thought, you thought the suit, they, they were just suit wearing guys. But right. The makeup, it was, it, was, it was a play on the makeup. Right, yeah, exactly. So, truth be told, it was a play on the suits, right? And we went to a, um, like some wedding or funeral or something in Ohio with a bunch of cousins and they put all some call this sack where all these relatives like lived or something. And they put all the kids, all the teenagers in one thing. Now I wasn't a teenager, it was, you know, second grade. And I see the eight track there and it was with Nazareth Hair of the Dog. There was only two eight tracks. And there's a bunch of these teenagers getting high and stuff. But I'm like, can I put on that? So I put on Hair of the Dog first because I thought it was funny here and son of a bitch. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at some giggle while he's swearing and stuff. Sure. Um, but then I put on the kiss and I listened to it all night. Now, this is when life changed because now after that, about a good couple months, about months later, Kiss Alive Moves came out. And I only found this out because I was playing with a friend of mine. I was playing still as a kid. You know, we're playing Make Believe and I'm the Hulk and all that kind of stuff. And um, and I actually admit that one time I wanted to be Black Widow. Boy, did I get the shit for everybody. He wants to be a girl. Anyways, um, but what happened was uh, with that is all of a sudden we're playing and I look at his older sister. I look over and I see Kiss Alive. I'm like, that, that, that's that, that's that band. That's that band. I'm like, he's like, yeah, it's a kiss, kiss. I'm like, can we put it on? And I put on, so we put on side four. So I remember hearing a sh- 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 People know that record that fades in with this, you know, flange, or then you hear uh, Paul Stanley faintly away from the microphone. Like, oh, hey! And then it's that nice little intro, like, uh, like it's fairly quiet. But when it kicks in that, kind of way today, it just blew my <laughs> fucking head off. And after that. I didn't want to, he, I wanted to hear more and he wanted to go do other kid stuff. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I stopped wanting to do that. I just wanted to listen to records. So kids didn't want to come over and play with me because they know I was just going to want to put on some music and listen, I just, but Mike, uh, Mike Alonzo, um, uh, um, you know, people know Mike, Mike plays now, plays drums and flog and Molly. Right. You, you, you went you went to you, you were you were in elementary school with, with Mike? Mike's a couple grades ahead of me. He was in my brother's grade. Okay. And I met Mike says he remembers meeting me like when I was like four or five and I was burning tar on the sidewalk with a big um, magnifying glass. And oh, it would, no, but I remember this conversation. It was like Young Frankenstein just came out. And we're talking about wanting to see Young Frankenstein. And then it was all of a sudden talking about rock, you know, rock and roll music and things like that. And it was like, oh someone else, but he was a couple grades ahead with my brother. 
right. and and stuff. But he ended up being my first band with him. Was that the archives? The archives, which is funny because we played an entire summer and we eventually went to play the talent show and they're like, what's the name of the band? We never even thought about naming it. So we named it off this Rush compilation that came out at the time that had like a, uh, uh, the first three records. But that band was formed because in sixth grade, I was walking home, another kind of life-changing moment. I'm sorry to be all dramatic. But there are these life-changing moments. You start thinking about this shit when you're older, like why, especially when you're disgusted by why did I even choose this career? And you're like, how did this start? Where did, why, what got me? And I remember walking home from school in the summer and Mike and this guy, John Helvey, were um, in junior high, so they're already home. But I'm hearing this, this feedback coming from down the street, closer to my house. He lived down my street. And Mike lived around the block. I hear this total feedback, and I was just like, uh, um, I'm like, I waited. I just was in a trance. I waited until it was quiet. And then they all held me because they were like in the window. Yeah. I'm like, you got a guitar? And he was like, I got a bass. Let's go and get it. All right. Because I got the bass. My uncle, I begged him for Christmas. Please, please give me nothing else but this, you know, out of Montgomery Ward book. My other uncle, my, the one that's still alive, uh, who actually um, <laughs> yeah, lived. He was more like almost a grandfather. He was in World War II and got stung by tons of bees. It's an interesting story. And my great grandfather was shot in the last. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He was in World War II and got stung by tons of bees. He was on patrol in line in the Philippines, and he was last in the queue. And some asshole in front shot at a like a wasp nest the size of a barn. By the time my uncle got there, he got stung by a couple hundred times. Yeah, pretty crazy. And and, yes, and, and something tells me that the bees in the Philippines in 1944 uh, right, are probably like, the, like this big. They're like the like, warriors or something. Yeah, the baseball like, furies. Yeah, it's not um, like the uh, fucking bees that I dealt with by growing up in New York. Right? Right. And his father, my, my grandfather, I never met in World War One. he got shot on the last day of war. He got shot, mistakenly surprised another soldier, and they shot him in the leg, and he crawled back to enemy lines, and basically, I thought all the war is over. Interesting. Okay, but I so figured were, off were you Were you okay. playing bass in the archives? So yeah, so that was the thing. I ran home and got my bass. They go, just go home and get bass. I'm like, okay, and I ran upstairs, and there's an airline amp that came with that guitar as well. Sure. And I grabbed my Montgomery Ward bass, and I grabbed it early and my mom's like, oh, you know, you shouldn't you know, I get electrocuted with that, you know, which is funny because I did get shot like mad in that basement. But I remember going down that street, walking down there with holding that basement, holding that amp, and have no idea that I would be doing that in other countries. <laughs> you know what I mean? It yeah. wasn't even the thought. It was going to go do it. And we screwed around. Most of the time we made feedback. We even would set up mics on all the amps, everything, and just sit there and just let it get feedback for a while. We didn't realize that we were being so experimental, but it was, you know, like Led Zeppelin and shit like that. And then Devo came out and uh, Are We Not Men, all of us flipped out over it. And I should add, though, someone else was influential on that, was another guy in their grade, was a guy named Matthew Smith. Matt plays in the band's Outrageous Cherry and the Bold Beats. Um, mm -hmm. He played with me in Crime City Solution as well. Um, Matt showed up on Mike's porch, we were listening to the eight track of We Sold His Soul for Rock and Roll, so fitting. And we're sitting on his porch, and so I'm in seventh grade and they're ninth. And uh and Matt comes up and uh he's got what was that summer between six and seven, sorry. And he had Trout Mass Replica and West Bruce Lang under his arm and Rainbow Live on stage. What was and the second one? What was the second one? Uh, uh Trout Mass Replica? Yes, you well, said no, oh, Trump Matt. It was West Bruce and Lang, Leslie West, like that was his favorite. Listen, we could do we could do a whole show and talk about Captain B Fart Oh, oh yeah, yeah. 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 So I mean, like, but, so, <laughs> but hearing that at that age, uh, hearing, yeah. hearing Trump Mass Replica, I mean, it was like, we saw his walk up to serve and go like this, you know, and it's like, it was, uh, it, Trout, we thought it was uh, funny, uh, but then we uh, realized uh, it wasn't. Excuse me, Trout Mass Replica produced by? Frank Zappa. That's right. Yes, right. but it's, uh, it's, it's so, that was the thing. We had the band and we played that talent show and I don't care who won or anything. I remember when the curtain opened, and I heard some girl go, we did Purple Haze, and t and the Talking Heads version of Take Me to River just came out. Okay. And I was really short. The bass was way bigger than me. And I remember hearing some girl go, oh, that's Troy and Laffy. And, and, and I was like, something like and I just put my head down. But after after the after we played, I remember they had us all, so all the kids that were in the town show in this back room. It's just like on, on Cloud Nine. But, you know, but I did in sixth grade also get up on stage and we mimicked what well, mind to kiss to Black Diamond and Making Love and Spit Blood. And yeah, and um, I actually did an actual solo, which is through the little amp. But none of the kids in the auditorium in sixth grade could hear, only, only the kindergartners could. So all they heard us was walking around in our mom's high heels, <laughs> looking at the stage. So I found that I was so embarrassed. 
but it was fun that thing it was that buzz of like being on stage and doing that it felt not it you it's like no it, yeah no it felt uh incredible obviously it's like it's uh it was a very bullied kid and I, you know and i never really cut friends they always moved every time i had a friend they moved they moved they moved and then eventually you know i did and then eventually spent my life moving around so i'm used to transient friendships i suppose that's a prophetic statement you know i was a bit of a bullied kid my friends moved and playing an instrument really gave me an outlet to express myself yeah it, it did and when i played i just didn't care about that stuff that yeah. the catharsis came on its own i suppose sure so you, so I know uh, after high school, you moved to L.A., uh, you attended the Musicians Institute, Institute in Hollywood, and uh, soon after, or at some point, I did not know this before I started my homework, that you were in Wasted Youth for a minute. Yeah, well, that was why I was going to the school. It was like probably about the third semester. There was a, I saw a guy walking down the hallway, and he had on his guitar a fear sticker. And, you know, you know, fear, you know, leaving. Yeah, sure. And um, and my friend, who I made friends with at the time, he had one on his bass as well. So we just start talking, and he said he was in Wasted Youth, and said they're looking for a bass player. So yeah, I, I joined. We rehearsed and wrote some stuff for about about a good couple months, maybe about two months, maybe. Um, we they had more parties than they actually practiced, but yeah, Joey Castillo was on drums. Yeah, we just saw Joey playing with the Circle Jerks. Wow. The guy's playing with them too. God, he plays with everybody. It's interesting. Gets good. Yeah, you know, he's he's really the train. He, he's really the train that's driving that thing right now. You know? Yeah, that was like you know, well, that was funny because I was still very naive, and they took advantage of a naive kid like me quite a bit, <laughs> but yeah. you know, in a fun way. I, you know, busting your balls and that. Kind did of shit. did you did you go through the whole sort of curriculum at a musicians institute, or did you get out and just start you started playing music? No, I I I, I did. I went the whole year there, but you know, they did the waste of you thing when I was there. And then I actually even backed up a, a, a kid from a, a, a kid child actor from Kids Incorporated named Ryan Lambert. I only because I got paid seventy five dollars an hour for rehearsals. Wait, I want I want to look it up. Ryan Lambert. Yeah, but then I um, I quit before we were supposed to play at Magic Mountain. I did, uh, but you know, I was just trying to take session work, you know, and um, but I just I did the schooling. I, so great teachers, Tommy Tedesco. I used to sit in on his classes about being in his Ryan studio. Lambert is an actor best known for his role as the iconic cool Rudy in the cult hit The Monster Squad. That was 1987. Yeah, so that was uh that movie I think he already did because that was yeah. that, that was around that time. I don't I'm not quite sure, but he was actually all right. His manager was weird. And they took pictures yeah. of us too on this like set, movie set to make it look like he's on the streets in New York and he's got like a leather jacket. And the guy was uh, um so I, these pictures were supposed to be for Teen Beat or Tiger Beat. So I might have ended up in Teen Beat or Tiger Beat. I don't know. It's kind of, it's kind of funny. <laughs> that yeah. <laughs> there you go. So 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 you you sort of you you go you you do the musicians instead. You're living uh you're living out west. You're living in in, in I assume in, in L A. Yeah, I've uh, never been there before. This is my first time there. Yeah. You dick it around uh, in wasted <laughs> youth a little bit. And what happens next? Is it is it flotsam? Well, I, actually, what's interesting is right when I started going there, yes, lots of a little bit, but when I started going there about a month was that Metallica thing happened. Um, you know, Cliff Burton, um, you know, died. I th and I thought the band, so I was only, I was about a month, or see, that, it was October, so I was only about two months or so in, into classes. You know, I just moved out there and he heard he died. So I thought the band was done. Even, if, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, I, 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 I guess so. That makes sense. I was going to say the Metallica audition happened before Flotsam. Of course it did because the, the because the slot in Flotsam opened when Jason Newstead joined Metallica. So, of right. course, uh, we're just real quick. I want to shout out. Uh, it's Sunday. I want to shout out Anthony Mio, uh, original Biohazard drummer, who's oh. the first, first time I've seen him um, uh, in the chat room. Yo, Anthony Mio, it's almost safe to say if it wasn't for you and that band, I wouldn't be doing the show right now. So what's up, Anthony? I hope you're well. So back back to the back to the metal back to the Metallica um uh audition. <laughs> and as folklore would have it, did did you did you you didn't in, you didn't seek that out, right? It just sort of you got, you just happened to, were you tagging along for the day or, or it, it, it was set, set the table for us. 
Well, it was weird because I, you know, he died, you know, and it was weird. We were walking down the street, and I'm meeting a friend of mine, and some simple of and some guy just randomly just goes, I guess we look like Metallica fans or something, and said, you know, Cliff Burton just died. You know, it's just fucking horrible. I met him um, back, you know, before a show when I would go see them on the Ride Lightning tour, and he was really kind and stuff. He asked, he asked me for weed, and I didn't, I'm like, sorry, I, and I didn't smoke weed at the time, so he just, you know, okay, bye. Um, but anyways, um, and now his song was me. You should audition. I'm like, oh, that band's done, man. It should, it should. I thought it was done. You know, what do I know? And but then this guy Scott Earl used to be in the band TKO and another band called Culprit was going to the school there, and he comes up to me, and he was more into like rap and stuff. You remind me was, of David What was Durant. his name? What was his Scott name? Scott Earl. Scott Earl. TKO, I remember. Yeah, yeah, and Culprit was a band. I guess the uh, um the guys in that band knew him from. Uh, from That's Metallica. like a good name for a hair metal band, Culprit. Right, but uh, so it's Scott, though, um, it's friendly with them, but yeah, he's like this daily Roth kind of guy. He even had these like Bo Derek cornrows in his hair, but he took him out for the audition. But he was like, You know, this shit. can you help me learn master puppets and sanitarium? So I helped him learn them, and he's like, I, I want someone to drive with me up to San Francisco, and I've never been there, so I'm like, I'll go with you. Never once was the intention of me doing anything, no bass in me, nothing. So I go up there with him, and then he knew some women up there that uh, let him stay there and they like, let me sleep on the floor. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, a, a, a sleeping on the floor, like I'm like, like shirts or something like that. And I see him sneaking out like Santa Claus with his face. And I'm like, oh, I'm coming with you. So I like, no, no, you're going to end up auditioning. I'm like, I don't even have the face. I just wanted to go. I mean, I was like, the fuck I came there. I only want to hang out with these, these women that, did, that were, obviously didn't want me there. Mm -hmm. And so I went there with him and he went and did his deal. There's people waiting. I'm just sitting there looking through magazines and you know, sitting on the couch and keeps Captain Beefheart. There was a guy there, the older gentleman that we started talking and about Beefheart. I don't know how it got on that, but that was a big deal. Then he was, we had to go, he was, he was good luck with your audition. I'm like, I, I'm not audition. He goes, well, you don't play? I go, yeah, I do. He goes, you know, stuff like, yeah, I go, but I don't have a bass. He goes in backs and fetches this Rickenbacker, this tobacco um, to Rickenbacker. <clears throat> and I'm used to a Rickenbacker basis. So um, I'm like, all right. So he hands it to me, let him in the line, with all these other guys, and Scott comes what, what on. Was it? Uh, let me ask. The line for the metal for, for at the time for the audition was it a long line? Were there a was, lot of Were there a lot of guys? There was about nine guys or so ahead, um, ahead going at this at this point, and and just and it was almost like this. Um, it seemed like a place that used to be like perhaps an like automotive place that converted into a studio. Mm -hmm. So they were all in this other whole room, and you could hear them playing the songs, and they're playing them ultra fast. They start right. like um, uh, they start massive puppets like bah, 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 and they start, and then you go quiet. Then you see a guy walk out of his base hall, like, you know. So, anyways, sorry, making this so long. So I'm in, I'm in the line. It's okay, this is this is very interesting. I, I'm in the line, and and Scott comes out with his, and he actually made it through both of the songs. I was happy for him because I helped him work on the tunes, and he comes out and he sees me in the line. He goes, "Oh, you're gonna audition?" I'm like. Yeah, this guy gave me bass. And right when that happens, this guy comes out and he goes, hey, they're only going to take one more person and they're done for the day. Everyone else is go. And Scott's something like, oh, tough luck, come on, let's go. And I'm just, all of a sudden, what the hell came over me? And I'm 19, but I look like I 15. Can, 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 I, can, I, um, can I dictate the quote here? If these motherfuckers don't audition me, then they're making a big mistake. Yes. <laughs> and he looks at me and laughs, smiles, and he goes, really? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, hold on a second. He closes the door, goes back in. Meanwhile, all these guys just looking at me like, ready to fucking kill me. And I'm a short kid, and I'm not very violent. So, but also he was said, come on in. So I walk in, and Lars and Kirk. You, you, you went to the front. You basically walked to the front of the line and walked in. Yeah. And just walked straight in. And then down at the end of this hallway, I see Lars and Kirk. And they're eating at this little table and walking. They don't really like looking at me and staring at the face. And I'm like, hey, uh, I, hi, I'm Troy. Well, let's go home, Lars. This is Ralph or something. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be funny with her. So I'm like, hi, Kirk, whatever. And they're like, uh, oh, man, look at that face. It's sick. Where'd you get that? I'm like, oh, the guy here let me use it. And they're like, what? So then I go, they're like, we're going to get the setup. And it was this big rig thing set up that I didn't really know all that shit because I was just plugged into a regular end. Uh -huh. And I'm trying to figure out something that James comes on my shoulder and he's just like, uh, you know, do you know how to usually play with distortion? Because I put the distorted. I'm like, yeah, but usually it's big muff pedal or something. It's all right. So I'm playing, making this longer. But anyways, we ran through both songs and they were like, wow. And then they're like, call your phone number. I'm like, I don't have a phone. So Lars gave me his. And uh, 
they asked me like what what am i into and i mentioned it like oh i like kate bush i like probably and gristle and, you know I like, ray, <laughs> I like ray charles i like why not call me stravinsky you know sitting in front of like, me do you like any metal at all and i'm like oh I, you know, I, I like Slayer, and like, because that was their nemesis at the time too. Um, and it was interesting because also they also offered me a drink, and I didn't drink at the time. They were like, found out was strange. Did and, and and did you do two songs with them? Well, I went to go leave. They had, was going to leave. They're like, okay, we're done. They're like, great, you know, keep in touch. But then I went out in the parking lot with 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 Scott, and I'm going to add something to the story that I've never actually added. Um, they go, they said, the guy comes up and goes, hey, can you come back in? Um, so, so, the, so the first time you went in there, you didn't even play music with them? No, I did. We ran through uh, Master Puppets and Sanitarium. Okay, got but it. But they wanted me to, they, I, when I started to leave, I guess they were like, let's bring him back in again before I left. They're like, can you come back in and play some more? Yeah. And I said, yeah. And they go, but can you use your friend's bass? I guess because that other bass, they thought maybe something was up with it. Maybe it was a little, I don't know. Yeah, but I go back in there with it, and it was he had those kabuki bases. It was like a surfboard. It was green. It was gross. Right, right. And um, weird headstock. And so I go back in, there and I also but one thing they said to me is they go, "So that's your friend's base." And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, "Was he mad <laughs> about when he used it?" And I'm like, "I don't know." It was almost like they took glee out of it, and that was really kind of bugged me. Put a little sour on it, but they would also what else you know. So I never really learned a lot of those songs, so I improvised them. I used to jam with them, some of them with some old friends of mine. This guy, Paul Pulverenta, actually, Polly uh, played with Elliot Smith for a while, and he's in a band called the Islands now. He's from Polly, he's playing the band with them back then. But, anyways, um, yeah, uh, we uh, did like Whiplash, Creeping Death. So, he's where I remember at one point uh, suggested Trapped Under Ice, but James couldn't remember it, so I was going to show him a bit. Um, and it went well, you know, it was fun, but I improvised that whole fucking thing. And that must, I, but you know what? That that in a lot of that probably scored a lot of points, man. You know? Scott was so pissed at me, and we went back afterwards to that where those women were, and I overhear them. Just, you know, he was just really mad, like I set out to do it. And I always hate when people think I have a plan because I, I don't. I'm just wing freaking everything. Almost everything that's ever happened interesting to me in life is just things that just I didn't see. Mostly the things I seek are the things that elude me. It's like the splashing in the water rather than you know so go. so after that was there was that it or was there oh, another we talked on the phone i would go to um the ymca and put quarters in or or i actually called him um when you know he's doing reverse the charges yeah i'm like I, like if you're calling for person or something collect i called call them collect i called lars a couple times and we talked and then he's they were gonna fly me back up i didn't bring all the records there with me mm -hmm. you know when i moved out there and I had this tiny little studio apartment with a brick wall for a view and, you know, and uh, everything. So I uh, wouldn't, they had me go to Electro Records and I walk up and I got the cassettes. And so I was going to learn all their stuff. But right away after that, he goes, well, he goes, we're going to go with this guy. He's a little more our age and um, and it's going to work out, but we really appreciate it. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. And he was like, but we'll put you on the list for a show with the country club in two weeks. Um, and I'll so I went to that show. But after the show, we ended up in this room kind of hanging out. And I brought my friend, but my friend brought the super fan with him. So oh. we're in this room and they started doing this, like, you know, just having a party and people on just hanging oh. out. And I've never been to parties really. I, you know, as a kid in school, I never went on a date or anything like that. I don't went to a party. So it was like there, but this guy kept on going up to Kirk and like he was Sophia Loren or something. And it was oh. like, and that, so eventually their manager was like, Troy, look, you're a nice kid and everything, but get you and your fucking friends out of here now. So like, I, I do, I do, I do like the Sophia Loren reference. Yeah. As all right. It's all on a plane once at JFK uh, at the airport. She looked lovely. Yeah, yeah. It was a goddess. Um, yeah, but yeah. anyway, but so that was it. We talked and he got that, then went to that show, and that was it. You know, and it's funny because I didn't see him for years until uh, Dirt Bonds played at Orion Festival, and I just bumped into him, and I'm like, you don't remember me, but and he's like, oh, my God. Oh, that's right. Oh, my God, that's who. Yeah, I forgot. Because he was at Third Man Records, and Ben Blackwell there, and Jack White said, oh, you know, Troy Gregory was who? So, so two weeks after these auditions, Metallica was playing already with Jason Newstead. They got that wow. together because they had a whole Japanese tour, and oh, that was I the see. thing that really helped Jason because he learned the entire set. I yes, see. so yeah, so that was the thing. Then they got Mike Spencer on bass, Flotsam and Jetsam did for a good, a good year. And right, that was why I was going to school. So, so there, there, there was, there was a year. So, so Mike Spencer replaces Jason Newstead and Flotsam. 
How does the flotsam thing come into your orbit? This guy, Chuck Beeler, he, I played with him one time in Detroit. Um, it filled in for his band on bass. He played drums. He ended up in Megadeth. They were recording the record so far, so good, so what? Sure. And it was a comic book shop that used to be on Melrose that he used to walk down to get, like, you know, um, comics. And I um, walked, and I saw, I saw Dave Mustang come out of the studio. So I went and knocked on the door. And I'm like, is, is, is Megadeth freaking out? And this guy's like, what? You know, like, I, I, know the, can tell, I know the drummer. Can you tell him Troy Gregg was here? And Chuck comes out, you know. And then I went in there and they played me some of the stuff they're working on. And I, by this time, I actually, my brother moved out to L.A. and another friend. And we moved to a place since so I had a phone. And so I gave him my number and said, well, go hang out. And then I just got a call from him. And he's like, hey, it's Bam Plots and the Jetsum. We're looking for a bass player. And, um... Yeah, I think it was, we're touring with them. So we had the same manager, this guy, Keith, whatever his name was at the time. Um, and he's, they're like, yeah, we're going on tour with them in Testament Sanctuary. And I think it was, you should get the gig. And they're getting ready to record, going like for records and blah, blah, blah. And I did, I've never heard them. So um, I said, okay, I'll, you know, I'll let them know I'll be interested in, you know, I was doing session work and looking for session work anyway. And so my brother and I walked down to the record store on Hollywood Boulevard and I picked up Doomsday for the Deceiver. And, and that's, that's, the re- that's, that's, the record, that's the record before No Place for Disgrace, right? Yes. Have you ever seen the cover? Right. <laughs> and I, but my, my, I go by my initial, I remember my initial reaction the first time seeing it. And, yeah. um, and oh my God. Yeah. Oh my Lord. Yeah. So that's what happened. And I went, they flew me out to audition while Mike was still, they had me watch a show, Mike's last show. Now they went kind of straight, weird watching someone play knowing that you're going to take his gig. But I, yeah, first time, I, I, I met him though, I went to Kelly Smith and I was with my brother, he came with me to the show, they were playing at the country club in LA. In LA. And they're like, uh, he goes, who's your favorite bass players? And, uh, and I mentioned, you know, old Kenny Lee, James Jameson. And, you know, who's your favorite bass player? It was Jason Newstead. It was like, like, oh, it's like someone going, "You'll never be better than my last girlfriend, you prick." Oh, and God. it was really weird way. Me and Kelly, we had a woo kind of relationship. We're cool now, but it's like a, a real odd couple. I mean, really, it was Felix and Oscar, and I. It's probably more the Oscar in, in this case. Yeah, now, now, when, when, oh, okay, so go on. I want to know, like, when, they, how they give, how they gave you, how did you get the gig? When, when how they gave. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, uh, they came to my apartment one day after that show, um, and um, well, I went to their hotel, the one I got kicked out of, Metallica, um, actually right there off of uh, La Brea in Hollywood. <coughs> um, and uh, they had me like play for them, and we talked and got to know each other. And then they flew me out. And I re- rehearsed with them. They're like, "Great, you want to you know join the band?" So, you know, I figured I was. Get, get out of LA and, and you know, if they had work coming. I knew they were going to Europe and a uh, record label. It just, it, it just seemed like it was it was work and it was good work. And so I uh, ended up moving, pack it up. Everything. I could pack up everything I owned in freaking 10 minutes anyways at that point. So moved to Arizona. So, so you were joining a band that had a major label deal, correct? Yeah, they just got, they were signed to Electra, I believe, for a while. So I missed all yeah. the signing bonuses, as I always forgot to say. Right, but they, right. they it, it was nice, though, because what it did, like in Prong, in a certain, certain situation, it for a while, it would pay for your, your apartments. Sure. And maybe you'd have like about 80 bucks a week to spend. So there was nothing really to save. You know what I mean? You're just kind of, you know, you're just going by. But it was cool at least to have that. So that I had, so I had, Time I'm in, they did go in between record labels for a while, and I would move. I moved into their uh, practice place, practice place, and slept there for a while, a yeah. couple times. But uh, you know, they were all grew up there, so they all had friends there and family. Arizona guys, yeah, yeah. And, and so, that's you. That's you in this in this promo shot on the on the right, bottom right, on the right. Oh god, right. yeah, yeah. We were really. It was. I remember. You guys was, look really. You you guys look really young here. You look like you're 19 years old here. I, I am. I think I'm tw- I, just, I might have just turned 21. At the photo yeah. shoot, there was a refrigerator full of beer, and I, I started drinking around this time. And I'm not. I've all gone through different phases of of bad drunk, from blackout, what the fuck happened, drunk, to silly drunk, to weepy <laughs> dumb drunk, to the point where I try not to get drunk anymore and just. Well, I can now not. 
choose to because I chose to before. It wasn't an actual mm-hmm. problem. I wanted to get blitzed, and when I didn't want it, I stopped. Um, but they, uh, I don't know how I got to that point, but it was like with lots of I started kind of do it. And Kelly was not, Kelly came out of Narcotics Anonymous and stuff like that. He had some problems with drugs when he was younger. Those guys were uh, a good chunk older than me, except for Mike Gilbert, the guitar player. Really. I like, I like, I like this one here. It's like a real Arizona shot. This one. But that, so I drink. I never, in that picture you showed, I was just blotto, stupid drunk. And I remember the photographer doing the whole, give me some attitude guys. And it just seemed like a put on like SCTV yeah. or something, you know? I like this one. Oh, that's yeah. an, at, uh, a uh, Camelback Mountain in Arizona, which is beautiful. That's my favorite thing. I, I, I like you're stuff. rocking the you're rocking the Bob Marley shirt, right? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. um, we still love walking in the desert. You walk in the railroad tracks in the desert, and it, it was just phenomenal. That's my favorite thing about living there. Everywhere I ever lived, I like taking long, aimless walks. Like so, so, so uh, 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 you know, like like Paulie says, um, "No place for disgrace" is heralded is like really one of the best thrash albums. Uh, any 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 um, recollections on on recording that or um, any 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 sort of insider you know do you, how do you look back on that record? It was pretty much already written. Like when they had me join, some of the songs they already sent me were demos, uh-huh. of Penny Terror and um, Escape from Within and all that type of stuff. So it was yep. pretty much already written. I didn't have a lot of creative involvement with it to tell you the truth right. I mean, even after i did my bass parts it was pretty much it even though kelly said oh no you came up with them no i was only there for that so my involvement wasn't much i actually even remade the record with mike spencer which is quite interesting yeah um i, I haven't heard that but it's uh you know it's that was kind of i had no control over that so i really was kind of like at that point even more like I'm the new guy in the band. Yeah. This I'm, is I'm, it. So, yeah. so when I looked at the record cover and I'm like, oh, that's fucking horrible. They just like shut up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but the thing is, is I, um, unfortunately, I I can't shut up. And yeah. uh, that became the problem. Is uh, me, did, me did, more than them. Did they re-record that record recently? Yeah, I think they did. It's probably some sort of licensing thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Or something, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's, what, that's what it seems like. I have a quote here uh, regarding the the next record. Now I know I know. And, and by the way, you, you, you I think you're the first guest that's actually smoking while we're doing the show. So oh shit, I should ask. No, okay. no, I like I like it. I, I, I mean, it's seeing Ali for movies like has gore, violence, smoking. Yeah, I see what you're doing, and I like it. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. For, actually, Jimmy G from Murphy's Law was smoking grass on the show. So oh, okay. okay, I could do that too. You okay. can do whatever you want. Just don't shoot dope on the show. That's a bit well, nice. no, I, I never can. Oh, Johnny Wasted. Okay, so, okay, maybe you're not the first. Anyway, so regarding so so you guys, um, um, uh, Flotsam and Jetsam, Leave Electra, signed with MCA, uh, 1990. The storm comes down, and, and I quote: "I was spending a lot of time alone, reading and writing stories. I had just discovered James Joyce and William S. Burroughs." and was really into their work, which I know influenced a lot of that writing. Also, at that time, I was starting to look into the endless schools of thought found in theology and science. I also started writing songs that were in no way appropriate for Flotsam, and it was frustrating to me. Inner and global turmoil is a big theme of that record. It's, yeah, I mean, that sounds so, again, so, so maudlin, so dramatic. Um, it's, it's, it makes for for a good conversation and and rather pretentious. But the thing is, is this, you know, again, keep in mind that I didn't really have teenage years. Me being in Flotsam was like, for what I eventually taught the most friends was how most people being in college, even though I went to Musicians Institute, I, I was there all the time. I was constantly studying. I took advantage of that school. Definitely. Um, it was open 24 hours. So, you know, it was there all the time. Right. Right. Uh, but so with thoughts, I mean, it was the first time I was, I still wasn't really confident uh, when it came to, you know, meeting girls or anything like that, but I was starting to actually meet really friendly, nice people. And I, I mean, I became more social than I had ever been. And, um, but also as growing up, you know, I was turning 21 and starting to realize things that I thought I knew. Of course, eventually things that I, I thought were bullshit too, would be what I believed at the time. Right. I was going through that. Uh, my uncle passed away too, and uh, you know, it just life in the sense. So, I was, and the thing is, is that you were saying in between Electra and MCA, there was a lot of time. 
it took a long time to write uh, when a storm comes down record. Um, in I the band. See. And that's when I went and were in between labels. And in between that time, I was living in Tempe. And so I had a lot of time to myself and I was making other friends. I made friends with tons of people, not in their circle, really. And I uh, just started exploring things. Well, I had time to read more and things and question my beliefs sure. and uh, just life in general. And look at it just a different dogma. It's just for to see what the correlation between all of them. And, it, 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 and usually it's just to get people thinking in real time, you know, hence things like prayer or ritual, any kind of movement. You're, that's why it's f- so fulfilling, just like a roller coaster of sex. And um, so anyways, I just uh, which got all into that type of thing and I started writing more and um, studying writing and realizing how much I'd like to be in a songwriter, not a singer songwriter like Harry Chapin. <laughs> um, yeah. like as we were talking about, I, I just, but same for writing, I was trying to take it more seriously and film wise. And I realized for me, for music, and this is still very true. Um, it's the act of doing it, the, the creative process, which is the most fulfilling, as well as being on stage where you, you're on the tightrope as well. And I love that, you know, just like how certain actors prefer theater to television. You know, that's I like that for about being on stage. But also I like the creative process. So it's like a basketball player. You're, you're, you're a basketball player when you're on the court, not when you're posing for the cover of Wheaties. Mm-hmm. And I realized even more so that that's so why I, I didn't like, I felt weird giving autographs. I felt so embarrassed in a way. Like, I don't have obviously a good self image sometimes of myself. So it's like, you know, when you're like that, you um, take adulation, it feels strange. And like, you know, kind of like the photo shoots, you know, give me, give me some, to, you know. Yeah, I, yeah I, I, I can imagine as a, as a young person being thrust into that, it could, it, was, it, it, it would be. Especially one, I guess it depends on your background, but I, yeah. I, could see, I could see how, you know. Yeah, it wasn't my scene, and that was the thing. I remember reading about Neil Peart from Rush having a kind of yeah, very similar right. kind of deal with that. And I kind of felt that way. So I was goofy as shit on, like, the mega that tour. I was on a freaking tour in Europe, and I was, like, 21 and single, and I was happy. And um, I just went off and made friends with people and the locals and stuff like that. Um, except one night I got really drunk and I, we shared a bus at Sanctuary and I guess I chastised both bands horribly. The next day, all the guys in the crew and the manager were laughing. Oh, you were great last night. All the other bands were like, you, you <laughs> asshole. But you, put was, on a, you put on a great great show last night and I'm not talking about on stage, right? And, yeah, and they were ta- and, and so they were uh, talking about, um, you know, I just knew this was, wasn't what I was going to do forever. And in respect to them, this is something, and obviously Eric still does it as well. This meant everything to them. And I realized I was the one fucking it up one, but I really wanted to try with, with When the Storm Comes Down. Really, really wanted to. So I wrote tons and tons of lyrics for them. Stupidly, I should have got together with Eric AK and worked out melodies and took an account of his voice and his eyes. Sure. But I, 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 see. I wasn't yeah. thinking that at the time. You know, I was still very a novice composer. And um, you know, learning. So to me, that was me in college still, was learning that and learning how to be, behave on, um, you know, and a tour somehow not to, you know, again, very silly. And uh, the more serious they became, the sillier I became. And I didn't get involved with any of the kind of, you know, debauchery people I say. I would say that term to party like a rock star. What the fuck does that mean? Because anybody yeah. can get fucking drunk and do fucking drugs and pass out and be an ass. I, anyone, you know, yeah. it's just like. Uh, I never was enamored by that kind of thing. That wasn't when I got it. Just when I got the first kind of experiencing that aspect of it. And here I am on a show. Bach and is, this, is this one of yours? <laughs> the, the song E-M-T-E-K is one of all time favorite lines. It's about a guy who volunteers for a government experiment because he needs the money. My peeling quote, my peeling skin turns green. At least I can pay the rent. That was, that's, that's, uh, yeah. Um, there was a, Bunch, yeah, right. A bunch of the stuff though got cleaned up by the road manager Eric Braverman because they said some of they couldn't understand it. And right. unfortunately, when he went to it, it, it changed the meaning of everything. Yeah. But that one was for about because I was going to when we were in between. You know, I needed work. We was no income coming in, um, and I was going to. I saw a thing for experiments at ASU, and I was going to do in it, but that I uh, had all these ideas about what, what would happen. Um, with it, so I, I obviously did. And I got a job at a record store. I worked at Tower Records for a while there in, in, uh, in Thomas uh, Street and, and, and there. So I was working there uh, while I was in Flotsam between there. And then uh, we did Storm, and uh, 
it just did it. We were in Ithaca, New York with Alex Perialis. It was a nice cat and everything. But so we got IC College and um, Cornell University there. Yeah, yeah. And um, those guys, um, the first couple of weeks was basically the first bunch of weeks was just those guys doing guitar and drums. And Justice for All came out, which if someone loves this, I'm sorry, but I think that's one of the worst sounding albums. But Mike and, and Kelly thought that record sounded fabulous. Oh, God. And so, of course, being a bass player, I'm like, oh, God, you know, what's going to happen to me in this? So, um, and, and that's, that's crazy. I think and, that's, that record sounds great. It's got no bass on it. You know? Then Jamie Hoffman came in to manage them, and she wanted me to do the interviews instead of them. But I was told not to badmouth the band, which just sounds so horrible at, at this point. Um, but anyways, they, um, we were out there and eventually I did my bass parts. Like, so I spent that time going to Cornell University and IC and meeting people and hanging out in the bars. So finally I go to do my bass parts and, uh, those guys were going to go do something that day. They're like, okay, it's your day to do it. They put us up in a little, uh, like drive motel, mm -hmm. hospital of Walmart. And I, uh, went, I did my bass parts about a couple hours and <laughs> <laughs> they come up like, okay, you just see me reading a magazine. And all of a sudden, it's like, you, what, what are you doing? You haven't started yet? I'm like, no, I'm done. You can't be done yet. I'm like, we've been practicing these songs forever. We've demoed them in a studio. And right. I mean, it's they didn't, it's not going to change. It's not John Coltrane, man, you know, and everything. It's, and, not, it's, it's, it's not Tales from a Topographical Ocean side three. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Which I used, and, to, and, so I used to know how to play. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that was a nice one. You know, I, I, I mean, I don't, I, I, I want to, I, I got to take a break, but, but just before we go veering off, we're going to come back and, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to put something, excuse me. So this, this here from Paulie, I saw Troy play in Flotsam three times in 1990. Once at the Ritz with Leeway and Prong opening, so. once at Toad's Place in Connecticut with Prong opening, that. and once in Sundance. Troy joined Prong after that tour. So let that be our intro. Let me take let me take a sponsor break. When we come back, we're going to bring a special guest on the show, uh, a, a good friend of both of ours. Um, we'll see you back in, in in a couple minutes. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. Uh, we're going to take a sponsor break. We'll see you in a minute or two. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as t-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections of music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Hey guys, Vlad from Organic Grill. As you can see, we're in a new location on West 3rd Street, right by Blue Note and Comedy Cell. The place is bigger, kitchen is bigger, we have more varieties, more food. We are looking forward to treat you guys with great dishes. All Hardcore Chronicles, welcome to, to Organic Grill. We are going to serve all the events as we usually do, and we are happy to see you guys. Well, there you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Our guest today is Mr. Troy Gregory uh, from the Dirt Bombs, the Witches, Flotsam and Jetsam. We're going to talk a bit about Prong uh, and a couple other things. Hope everybody's well. Uh, I have to say, if you, I know there's a couple of newbies out there. We could sure use your support this show. Uh, there's a Patreon page, uh, there's a PayPal address there. There's also a super chat that we use. If you have a burning desire question do the super chat it comes through in color i can't miss it you go to the front of the line uh, i know that people have been asking questions through the whole show but uh usually the show format we uh field the questions uh during the last 20 minutes of the show so we'll, we'll be doing questions in about a half hour 25 um uh, minutes from now but hey there's a patreon page please support the show and thank you to everybody that does support the show I uh, want to shout out a couple of my my latest supporters, uh, Mikkel Ephraimson uh, and Julio. Thank you for joining Patreon. Scott Vigor and Hendrik Feller. 
uh, making PayPal contribution. That's honestly how I'm able to do the show is because you support it. So please, please continue to do so. Support. Support. A um, couple of other things I want to mention. Yeah, how about that? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, back, 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 back. Let's start with this real quick. Um, let me clear that out. A couple of events coming up here in La Ciudad de Nueva York. Sunday, October 15th at Organic Grill at our, our, our great friend and sponsor, Vlad Organic Grill. Uh, Don Foos is doing a book event, uh, signing copies of his new book, Motivate Me, at Organic Grill. The very next day, there's a free all-ages show on the Bowery, uh, Sunday, October 16th, with Slashers Live Fast, Die Fast, ID, yes, we are playing, uh, The Take and No Redeeming Social Value. Don Foos, uh, since he's in town, he's going to get up and do a couple songs with us, and he's going to do a couple of songs with The Take because two of his former bandmates from the Spud Monsters are in the take. So that's Sunday, October 16th. Rampage Fest, brought to you by Heggs. That's right, uh, Heggs and myself. Uh, it's become a tradition. Rampage Fest 4 is coming up at the Barry Electric Sunday, November 13th. Uh, there's been an adjustment in the lineup. Concrete Burial, the end AD has been added to the bill. Pembroke. Interestingly enough, Pembroke, the guy in Pembroke, broke his arm. So Pembroke is out. The end from Philly, the end AD is in. Down low, down low, next scars, fire is murder, the last stand, and Ron Grimaldi's death cycle uh, will be playing. And then, of course, Sunday, December 18th, it is the holiday slambery brought to you by Women of the Pit and GBT and the New York Hardcore Chronicles featuring Faded Line, Serial Poets, with Stephen Messina, Concrete Ties, Voice of Doom, Daija, Spoiler NYC, Alan Robert from Life of Agony's Side Project, Happy Birthday, Alan Robert, and our good friends in Sworn Enemy. And then Friday, November 4th, uh, as we're talking about our friends in DeWolf Publishing, they just put out the book, If It's Tuesday, This Must Be Walla Walla, The Wacky History of Adrenaline OD. Uh, AOD is playing the Bowery Electric. Last time they played there, it sold out. Tickets are available now. Uh, Fear Gods and Incendiary Device. It's going to jump off tonight. Uh, we will be playing as well. This is going to be a great event. Hope that you can make it. Uh, that said, um, what else do I need to do? Yeah, get on the Patreon, man. Get on the Patreon. Support the cause. These ads are getting professional. You know, I really like I really like the ads. I'm going up to New York Hardcore Comics to do them. I, I like the ads. I, I can actually stand up for a minute and stretch and run to the bathroom even. Imagine that. Um, so that said, uh, yeah, Dom Fu's coming to town. We're, we're, we're going to do a couple songs with them. Good dude. Yes, Heggs. Kevin Haggerty, Heggs. Rampage Fest. You know, that's right, buddy. Couldn't do it without you, Heggs. There's a real supporter right there, man. Thank you, buddy. Um, that said, uh, what else do I have on the agenda? I think we are – you know what? Let me just throw this in the mix real quick. Um, ID, we are heading next weekend. There will not be a show next weekend, actually, um, because we are playing Seattle. Lucky Liquor with uh, the Scoffs, FCON, and Fang. And then, of course, all our friends in Portland – um, we are playing uh, Crash Fest again this year with a slew of bands, including Fang, The Take, Doug and the Slugs, and a bunch of others. Uh, if you are in Portland on October 9th, come and see us play. We are very excited about playing our first West Coast shows. Um, certainly looking forward to the long plane ride out there, sitting around in Seattle all day long. Um, Totally shot and getting up there and screaming my brains out. So hopefully we will see you out there. Um, that said, let's bring on, I think I covered everything, right? Well, there'll be another break. Let's bring on our guest. What's happening, Troy? Troy Gregory? Hi. Hey. So How? How? <laughs> How? How's it going? Yeah. Um, you know, I want to bring, 
I want to bring a friend of ours on. Uh, viewers may recognize him. He's been on before. Um, he was a member of uh, The Undead. He was an Electric Frankenstein. Uh, he is a proficient writer. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Joel Gustin. Hey, man. How you doing? Hello, Joel. How you doing, guys? Hey, who's that with you, bro? It's my better half, Blaze. Hi, how are you? Hi, welcome to the show, Blaze. Troy Gregory. Nice to meet you both. Nice to meet All you. All right. Wow, we, we, we got an unexpected guest uh, <laughs> on the show. That, that's, that, that's, that's cool, man. That's cool. So, so you know what? I wanted to bring you on. I wanted to bring you on here, uh, Joel, because I know that uh, a couple years ago you wrote a, a prong, uh, a prong book. And we've spoken about that a couple of times, including when you were on the show. And um, I thought that maybe you could, you, you can, you know, maybe assist me in some of this. But, but yeah. Troy, I'm assuming that when you were doing those shows that that um, that Paulie talked about opening, uh, you, know, you guys are opening for Prong. Was that like a natural thing, Tommy? Hey, I need a bass player. Are you available? How no, it was, it, it was about a good, almost a year after I quit Flotsam that that happened. Okay. Because in Flotsam, um, I, me and the, uh, the woman who was the head of publicity at MCA, we, you know, we fell in love. And uh, we tried to keep it all quiet and stuff. And the band, they saw me with her and they were, they got really mad and had this meeting. They thought I was screwing around or something. They didn't know it was an actual you know, thing. And I was flying out to LA visiting her all the time. And they get this like, band meeting. You were sleeping like, with somebody. You're you were with somebody you're from the record label. Yeah, you're going to ruin a career. Yeah, it was like that type of thing. And all Dude. of a sudden, I'm just like, fuck, you know, fuck this, man. You know, I hated the record cover. That when the song comes down, we had so many great ideas. I worked on this whole artwork thing for it. And I get this, and even the artist that they got to do it, we went to his house. He had a lot of really great stuff. Gets a state when we get, I get it handed, and it was Spinal Tap. Like this, like is this a test pressing? Like, oh, this is the cover, and that the fact that they really remixed it, and we was happy with it. I enjoyed playing on them on stage because, of course, playing on stage is fun, and um, you know. But it's like uh, Prong was on that tour, and actually, I'm the one that got him on it. We had a list of bands to bring on, and I really pushed for Prong. Can, so, can, can I just quickly interject mm -hmm. that I could see why this you this record cover would not you would not be too thrilled with? This. I mean, the things that we. I mean, yeah. really, this is the best we could come up with. I'm sorry if anyone likes that, but it was like really when I saw that, it, it was like I'd rather have that June Safer the Deceiver cover. I mean, this is after all the trouble we went through it, and again, I wanted to, to direct videos. Basically, I started wanting to do what I'm doing now because I always said. I always felt like a kid. I thought I ain't gonna be worth my salt as a little composer until I've actually lived and experienced more. I go probably until my mid fifties and hello. So, and I feel like I'm actually doing my best work now, but it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, so I wanted to start doing, cause I always done artwork and animations and just make my own comics and with the paint as well and start messing with film things. And I love that whole idea from Devo and the residents that you can build this whole little world sure. of your thing. And I started really wanting that. And I knew I wasn't going to do it with them. So I left the band and I actually left the band, already quit, but I did uh, do a bunch of dates with them. And I would ride with Prong a lot. I would ride in their van on, and everything. And I wouldn't ride with the band or I'd ride in the rider truck with the crew guys. I'd ride in that bus. Oh, yeah. You, you, with that, you were done, bro. Music, in, music, in, the music. And, in the rock and roll world. When you start riding with the crew and you start riding in the, you're, you're done, bro. Yeah. And that's the thing, though, because, I, and I did like feel, I don't, it's, it's not good for the band, you know, and they, and they knew it too. And they're friendly guys. They didn't need that shit. Like I said, their hearts were in it. So I quit and I moved to LA for a little while and um, I tried to get up some stuff there. And then I followed her up to Portland and we broke it up and I moved back to Detroit. And then I started doing what eventually became the Witches. Mm -hmm. But after about a while, after prom, with my friend Matt Smith from Our Age Cherry, mm -hmm. and um, and helping him with uh, record the band the Bull Beats, not Bull Beat, the Bull Beats, um, with their first demos, and then I got a call. This is a weird thing. I got a call from Teresa Ensenat, who was the A and R at uh, MCA, really wonderful, nice woman. And she turned me on to Daniel Johnson, 
And, uh, and she called me really bad about it because she was so much in my corner, but she called me and said that like, uh, they wanted to keep me on MCA as a solo artist. I was blown away. But I, I um, and I also heard from uh, Kim Thale told me that uh, him and Chris were going to ask me to take Jason Everman's place. But they found out I joined Prong two weeks earlier because Tommy called me. I didn't feel confident myself as a solo artist at, at, time, at that time. And so uh, I get this call. And it's Tommy like, hey, we're getting rid of Mike Kirkland. And would you like to come out to New York? I was living at my parents again back in Michigan. We lived at the Holly. was about an hour away from Detroit. Was this was this an audition situation, or at this point he they just wanted he, me. he yeah. knew your skill set and it, 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 and the gig is yours if you want. And I traveled with them enough; they know what I was like on tour when I'm actually relaxed and serious. So, and, so let me. So uh, okay. So so let me let me interject. Joel, any perspective from the prong end at this point when they reached out to Troy? Well, I know. Um, it was kind of interesting time-wise with them because that was really when prong started to get some attention you know right. they had some things happen with the big to differ record on mtv um had a couple of videos people knew who prong was they had the major label deal at the time troy comes on board for prove you wrong which was the next step which sort of led to the beavis and butthead appearance and the remix ep so it was kind of a from a fan's perspective, it was, a, it was a very cool time to be into prong because I was in the flotsam hardcore as well as prong. So, Troy, when I saw that you had joined the band, it was like, wow, the best of both worlds kind of coming together. Um, but I had a question for you about your entrance into the band, because from my ears, when I listen to Beg to Differ, and I've talked to Tommy about this as well, they wanted to be, um, to kind of paraphrase Tommy, bad brains tight. Like everything was like tight and it was cutting and boom, boom, boom. Right. When you came on board, to my ears, it sounded like you loosened those guys up a little bit. <clears throat> a little bouncier, a little funk, funkier than Beg to Differ had been. So I was curious, would you agree with that assessment? And what do you think you brought to Prong at that time to maybe bring that sort of looser environment to things? I don't know. Maybe it just I maybe came off that that way. I mean, it definitely wasn't intentional. Um, I play completely, completely different bass than Mike Kirkland did. Actually, it's really funny. On a tour, who I mostly hung out with was Mike Kirkland. We got along fa fantastically. Um, I even kept in touch with them after uh, the tour. I call him every now and then. So that was another kind of weird, little bittersweet kind of deal because he was a friendly cat. Um, oh. You know, so it's like. You know, they took, took a train out there, you know, and we ran through some stuff and everything. And I, I just played how I play. And I tend to play quite busy. <laughs> and uh, even Parsons sometimes is like, ah. But I also encouraged, I think, Ted more on Ted really, his heart was like into a lot of like early dub and stuff like that. Things like, uh, you know, Prince Buster and King Tubby, Lee Scratch, oh, wow. Perry, Lee Scratch Perry, you know, Max cool. Romeo and the Upsetters. Yeah. And, um, and we listened to like a lot of that and also a lot of Delta stuff, Mississippi Fred McDowell and, you know, Violin Jefferson and, you know, um, cats like that. And uh, I just thought that like for his drumming, you know, that we incorporate more of that. And I think also the fact of Killing Joke and, you know, they're, they take the Chrome cover, they're from the sun. And it was just this kind of thing of like, well, we can do, like they had a song in there called Complications or something that, you know, we can do this type of thing. But they were all on board with that too. I mean, that's enough, just how Flossum was at the time when I went at it was Eric AK, not, not Eric, excuse me, Kelly Smith and Mike Gilbert called on the shots. Obviously, Tommy did in prong, and obviously because he's still doing it, you know what I mean? But they did encourage me to like, do you have anything? And I had some stuff I started writing with um, Matt Smith um, that became the song Hell If I Could. Mm -hmm. uh, off of that uh, record, but it was something I was jamming with back in Detroit beforehand. And so it was like we threw together some things and uh, we did the Stranglers cover of Get a Grip on Yourself. And you mm -hmm. mentioned the Bad Brains, one song in particular though, but a song called Brainwave. Tommy sang it, everyone thought it was me, and he's trying to sing like HR on it. It was, a, it, it was he loved uh, Doc, Dr. Knows of guitar playing so much and so that song was really a total homage let know? me let me address this uh, our our good friend and and and, and uh graffiti uh historian rs70 asks 
is prong a hardcore band? And, and let me answer that by saying, I, just my own thing, I would say no, prong is not a hardcore band, but certainly Tom Victor, being that he was a sound man at CBGB's, when, when, when I was playing in the High and the Mighty and an Antidote, and you know, for so many hardcore matinees, I think it's safe to say that in a lot of ways, uh, Tommy Victor has a lot of hardcore sensibilities that, that, that he brings to the party. Is, is that safe to say, Troy? He was very, very proud of his... Yeah, it's his heritage with that that with that scene, and he'd always he'd always say, "New York hardcore." We'd be in, a, we'd be in another country in New York City, <laughs> and, and, uh, but even though they New York hardcore, that type of thing. So he always pushed that. So I know he felt ripped off. He moved back it, to New York as well. What was it? Um, didn't Mark Dodson uh, uh, produce that record? Yes, yes, yeah, and, and we did it in just outside of uh, Philadelphia at this at this studio, and they put us up in. In a house again, those guys are all and they, they would take the piss. I'm mean, still very naive, and you know, I it's still and, in a lot of ways. For those, know. for those that may not know out there, Mike Dotson produced uh, a Sin After Sin by Judas Priest. Uh, he did Suicidal How Will I Laugh Tomorrow, which is a fucking great record. I mean, yeah. that, that I love that record. Um, you know, I'm not like the biggest metal guy, but that was a great that I love that record, and and also he did a, a, another record that I really love. Uh, and I just saw a documentary. Uh, we just watched it the other night. Uh, she, he, he produced um, Joan Jett, Bad Reputation. Oh, yeah, I didn't know that. That's right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting yeah. because we started writing stuff uh, left for the next record. I have actually demos of what would eventually become that cleansing record, which I've only heard once. Right. On um, the tell you the truth. But, like, I um, have demos of so many songs that end up, like, uh, like snap right. your fingers. Uh, with me singing half of it and Tommy singing a bunch of songs that didn't someone say, no, you should put these on eBay. You're not eBay. Yeah. I tried selling some shit on eBay before and um, I, someone gave me some old Star Wars toys. It was such a pain in the ass as all the people just trying to screw you. You know, you, you, but, you, you, you know what? I, this is years ago. I mean, just, just to go side on the sidetrack for at some point when the eBay thing, I'm going back probably 15 years ago, but when eBay was really starting to pop, I'm like, what sells on eBay? Old, hardcore, and rock t-shirts. Right. And I, I, I went into my closet. I had a box of all the old, hardcore shirts, like the original Agnon. I sold it all to, like, kids in Japan. Wow. Were like, you know, I sold my Warzone shirt for, like, 100 bucks. I was like, take that shit, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. That it's, I, nothing, I, I, I never keep anything in good condition. All my records, all my comic books, they're just too, too worn – so I don't want. Well I don't want anything in this life. You see, I, yeah, I, I don't want to get rid of shit. That shit, that shit stresses me out. I don't want. I don't want t-shirts. I don't want records. I don't want nothing. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, back to the yeah. back, back, back to the task. Uh, back to wow. the task at hand. So, wow. so, so, uh, um, you do that. You do the prong thing. Any other prom? Any other prong perspective, Joel? Before we move on to to a couple of songs that uh, Troy played with with Swans. Uh, yeah, I was just curious, Troy, because I don't know if you and I have ever really gotten into this, even when I did the book on you guys. Um, what did you think of the remix EP, that Thurwell and a bunch of, I think Paul Raven's on there too, doing some stuff. What did you oh. think of that EP that Prong did around that time? Uh, that was what Ice, Ice-T really liked. We oh, did, yeah? Yeah, we did, we did a show where him and uh, Fred Schneider, from B-52s were the hosts, Demon and Glass and Buttle Surfers and Soul Asylum played. It was an AIDS benefit thing at Roseland. Um, I trailed off there. Uh, the, the remix, we thought it was cool. Um, I wanted to remix one of the songs, and I kind of got, pfft, you know, again. And I also wanted to shoot a video. I was already talking about videos I wanted to do for what would be the next record, and kind of got that, but you don't really do them. And I'm like, well, I can. I know I can, you know, and. Again, trying to get that idea of that marriage of visuals is what with music. I guess that goes back to the old Archie's cartoons, right? And um, and Clockwork Orange soundtrack and all that. You know, looking at the pictures or the stills in the horror movies and imagining what's going on, and especially for Hammer horror and stuff like that. You know, and, and, uh, Mad Magazine too. You know, William Gaines. I mean, you, you and Tommy are are are. are, are friends these days correct that's safe to say we we didn't talk for a long time um we started coming around you know and they never hold grudges why it wasn't until point 
and um, invited me to a couple shows, but I was always out of town. And he actually asked me to do a tour once, but I was recording with Crime and City Solution at the time. And I might have done it. Um, but then he asked me to come down to St. about couple, well, whenever that picture was taken, I came down to St. Andrews Hall and I sang Prove Me Wrong with him, which was surreal. And it was great, it was great seeing him. And then I he came around again with the Gnostic front. And, and it was in Hamtramck, Michigan. If anyone knows Hamtramck, it's kind of like the Brooklyn, what Brooklyn is to Manhattan, uh, mm -hmm. to Detroit, and in a way. I guess I can go on and elaborate on it, but I won't. Uh, and uh, we got to hang out for a while. We hung out for hours because I showed up around the sound check. My wife was working at the bars there. So me and Tommy walked and went and had got something to eat and we're hanging out right. and just joking around. And you know, at this point, you know, you're old men, you talk about all the stupid shit. And even when you talk about stuff where you're at each other's throats, it just seems so trite, you know. You know, if me and Paris Mayhew and me and Evan Seinfeld could be friends in this day and age. Enough already. Everybody, Paris, you know. Paris shot a, the video for, for Flotsam and Jetsam with, uh, what's his name? We shot the video for Bad Brains, um, I Against Die video. I know who it is. That Paul, was, Paul, Rackman. Paul Rackman. Very good. Yeah, who, also yeah. did, who also did Sepultura Territory. Waterford Territory. I, speaking of CBGB, Sepultura, Igor and Max, their first time in New York. Yeah. They uh never been to CBGB's and um so I was it was one of CMJ things and I was at Igor and Max and I and my ball take you there and we got in the cab and they were afraid they're like oh there's gonna be a bunch of skinheads there that are gonna beat us up. I'm like they had this whole like weird idea of it and I might know if anything people are gonna ask for your autograph. You know, how's I, that? You asked for it, you got it. Bam. I hung out mostly at the how's CB's that? how's that? Yes. I am uh, mostly at the CB's um, pizza parlor and the gallery was open at the time. Because um, um, uh, Merle uh, from the Murder Junkies, G.G. Allen's brother, Merle, uh, mm -hmm. he was working at the pizza parlor there. Yep. And um, actually met G.G. there once, which is weird. Um, but met Alan Vega, though, one night. He bought me a drink and they gave me his blessing to cover Reign of Ruin. Um, and I went with Diamante Glass to the Mars Bar, which was my favorite bar. Uh, I mean, they're on a Bowery just to, yeah, to talk about an AIDS, AIDS benefit and get the walker home, which is so cool. It's just God, let me, let, let, this let child, me, you know, let me, God. let me wrestle this back. Let me wrestle this back. Um, cause I want to talk, I want to talk about, about, I want to talk about swans and I want to talk about killing joke. Yes. I know, I know, um, swans came first and, and I know, I know you weren't a member of the swans, but you played on a couple of songs, correct? Three songs on um, Love of Life. Um, I was still in prom at the time. Ted played on them with me as well. Oh, um, 1991, and, right. Yeah, and we yeah. went to Martin BC's studio, and um, we recorded there. We were there just for a few hours. Uh, Michael Gerard paid, paid me, um, if that's how you said his last name, I still don't know, uh, paid me 100 bucks a song. I played on three tunes, Other Side of the World, Amnesia, and Love of Life. And I went to that there, and yeah, that, that, was, that was it, basically. Um, Ted's good friend with Al Kizzy's um, from their still site and became friends with Al. Um, he came out to see me with the Dirt Bombs once and he goes, and he said to me, he goes, this band's so much more perfect for you. I thought that was interesting. I don't know what he meant by it, but uh, hopefully it was something positive. And 1996, um, uh, Killing Joke. I, I, I know uh, the Killing Joke family uh, is... <laughs> You know, is is pretty is is uh, <laughs> pretty interesting. Um, oh yeah, you 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 you. Someone you know, I post. Someone posted today. He wasn't in Killing Joke. Listen, well, they uh, considered me a member, so talk to them. You know, you know, mm -hmm. you know what? It, you know, and I'll say it, it was our good friend and supporter Paul Bearer from Sheer Terror, who uh, oh, who, like who, said, who said to me today, he wasn't a member of Killing. You know, he like. He, and, and you know what? God bless Paul. He's one of my patrons, man. He supports me. I like him. I know he's yeah, funny yeah. as shit. And and and, and I and I didn't say I didn't get into it with them. I hope he's watching the show. Joel, so any, any any perspective, any killing Joe perspective on on the uh, <laughs> was it was that the democracy tour? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, keep on laughing, show? but. <laughs> Yeah, well, first of all, I would never want to say anything to offend the great Paul Bearer because I do go to the <laughs> and I don't want to get hurt. So, right. hello. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Troy, what, you you had befriended Jordy Walker at that time, the guitarist in Killing Joke out in Detroit, and then he got a call one day, and before you knew it, you were touring with Killing Joke, right? It was so weird. My wife comes home from the bar she's working at, and she goes, the guitar player from Killing Joke was in here today with his wife. 
Like, oh, pff, what would he be doing in you know, Royal Oak, Michigan? And um, she sees the picture. She goes, yeah, that's the guy. And then one time I happened to be there with them. And I've met him. Like, I wouldn't, with, you know how accessible it is to go to a Kill and Joke song. I don't know if people know about this, but it, it, you can get backstage for Kill and Joke easy. We, we've even sent security away. And Jazz is like, we can take care of ourselves, which I can. <laughs> and um, so I've met them. Like, I drove to Chicago to see them. I love that band. You know, I get all the 45s and all that. And um, so, you know, we just became friends. And Laura and I went over for dinner with him and Ginny. And uh, he played me the democracy. They just got done recording it. I got to play his cool guitar. And that was kind of it. Then all of a sudden, I get this call. Like, while I was playing a gig, and I, I get this kind of message, call your wife. And she's like, Jordy called. And what's it called? And, and he's like, yeah, we do tour. And what thing was was cool originally it was going to be me and my brother. Um, but then Jeff Dudmore was available. And it sucks because Jordy came over and jammed with me and Todd, um, my big brother, uh, um, in the basement. And my brother was looking so forward to it. So, and again, another bittersweet thing that comes with getting some nice little deal was then my brother, who was expecting to do and go in a couple of weeks on this tour, did it and really prepared for it. So, kind of that's that would hurt me because they're doing it with him. It's a customism section. It was like, yeah, because we used to always fight and it was nice to finally, you know, do that. Um, so yeah, I ended up going to uh, uh, did the whole freaking tour and that, had the whole killing joke was experience. Was that a US tour? Or no, was it was that... all, all Europe. We did a couple of weeks rehearsal in England. This is the thing though, which was interesting is Jordy would not give me a set list. Now, I only knew their earlier stuff. I really, to tell you the truth, I stopped following them. I didn't right. know this pandemonium record at all that came out beforehand. And, um, Anyways, I caught some sort, which I realized later on in life, I caught some sort of bron bronchitis somewhere on the plane. I showed it by the time we landed. I was shit, just freaking out of it, like really sick. But Jordy wanted to go to the studio thing before we were standing. We were going to stay at Youth's place, so went to Butterfly Studios to pick up keys or something. It's like tricky, and all those guys there, and they all got everything coming out of all these different rooms. And Jazz is there, and he's all like, really did not want. A yank coming in on bass and, and he sees me and he's like who is this fucking kid jordy and he talked like i wasn't in the room and he's just like and he's going to me because i'm all sick he's all trying to get me to drink wine and smoke this big split and he's like we're a kid joke we smoke splits and we drink wine and we party and we live life about blah blah, blah 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 and i'm just ready to fucking die so that's how that starts so then we go to the actual rehearsal place the next day i'm still dog sick worse and I start. We start playing some of the stuff, and I don't know. Hey, let, let me let me just interject it. Eric Perello says, "I'm not a musician, but that seems like a hard album to learn." Well, it's. I fortunately can learn things quick, and this is what happened. So I get thrown all this stuff that they're finally given a set list, which I should have just demand it. Like but what is I, this? I, what is this? The Grateful Dead can I have a set list, please. But you know, but I'm Shorty. Is Shorty's very uh, fuck? You, know, you get it, eh? you know that type of thing. You know, he believed in me, which is nice. Jordy always, even when Jazzy gives shit, he'd go, oh, fucking annoy him, you know, that type of thing. And so what happened is we started playing, and um, it wasn't really happening. And um, I remember, like, and I'm really sick. And so I got to learn this, another 15 tunes, I think it was. And so I got, this like, the CDs from, like, the sound man, because he was setting up the lights, I think, the sound guy for rehearsals. And so I, and the guy from the keyboard was this herbalist and he gave me this root. It was horrible, but boiled it, drank that, sat up all night, vomiting, went to face, learning every one of these songs, stayed up all night doing that, got a little bit of sleep, woke up, having tea with Jordy, doing the same kind of deal, of course, tea. And, and then and, uh, on the way, listening to it on the way in the cab, till we get the canteen, all the way to start playing. We start playing and we do it. We hit the first song, boom, nail it. And I'm expecting, yeah, and George, Jazz just looks and goes, no worries. All right, next. But then we went into one of the songs. Um, it was like one of those pandemonium tunes or something. Anyways, I start playing it and it stops and jazz stops and he goes, You're fucking playing it wrong. That's not how it is. And it gets right in my face. Right? And I'm going back to revert to how it was as a when I realized that bullies don't like to fight. You know, I realized that when I realized that in high school, when it'd be like you just walk right up to them and punch them. It's like getting right in his face, but at the same time, I'm just like that's exactly how it is. I'll fucking play for you right now. And he goes, we're not doing that version. We're doing the remix version. And I'm like, I'm supposed to know. And he goes, yes. 
this is Simon Sinek. And he goes, <laughs> and he laughs like this and pats me like this, like this. You're going to be all right. And afterwards, we got along fantastically and just nailed it. It was so weird. Yeah, that's that. that, that it was makes... like this. I, it was strange. It was, it was like a hazing almost and stuff. And, um, but it was ah. one of those songs every night was so cool. People thought I was you because it's from a distance and I used one of his basses because I smashed mine. Ah, Life in the Killing Joke Circus. That must have been. It was. Oh, because you were up all night on that bus. All night. Everybody's singing along to David Bowie's Hunky Dory. I brought Sparks' first record. We were all singing <laughs> that. And drunk. And drink, I remember these bottles falling in Jordy's head. At one point, Jordy started throwing these bottles out the window on me and the freaking uh, uh, other tech guy just had to put a bunch of pillows on him, like on the couch. And we sat on him for a little while. And then he gets up and his face is all like this. It's all pink and he's laughing his ass off. He's a uh, He's a very unique guy as well as a unique guitar player. I mean, I really, Jordy's, uh, he's very, he's a unique guy. He reminds me of um, a little bit of like Patrick McGowan in The Prisoner. He's got at a little point, bit of that, but not so much hate. It's more like, no more blase. At this point, were you a Rickenbacker guy? I Rick and, I got my Rickenbacker, that one right there, it's kind of a funny story. Um, yes, I love Rick and Backers. I always love the way they looked, you know, and I think yeah. Squire was one of the first guys I really sure. enjoyed and Getty Lee and I see sure. Bruce Austin from the jam and Pete Frontman from the contenders. I just loved how it looked. And, um, but my, there was one for sale for $275 in the, um, out of the trade times, which Mike Alonzo called me about. And so one of my relatives died. So I begged my parents, please. And, um, I got that bass and I had, and they were like, oh, you're going to get up like you did the flute because I tried doing flute. And I um, had that bass. That's not it. It was an all black one. And I um, had it all the way up to the end of a Dirt Bombs tour about 10, 11 years ago, where um, flying from at the end of the tour, flying from uh, Croatia to Malaga, Spain, and none of my stuff showed up and it's gone. Finally, is that, is that this one? Is that N this one? No, now that one came from because after that happened, I came back home. I left the Dirt Bombs for a while and I started teaching at School of Rock. And I um, was had one of my adult students, and she overheard me get a phone call to play on this one Andre Wayne's record. And I said, uh, yeah, sure, you guys got a bass I can use. And she's like, you don't have a bass? I'm like, no, it's the first time since I've been, you know, 10 or so, or I, I haven't had a bass. And she thought it was so insane. So the entire adult class, Christmas came around, that bass and those pictures um, they presented me with. I just, tears coming down my eyes. I've never owned a new instrument in my life. Everything's always been... Used and but it, it's all it, what you got there, Joel. It's just a four thousand one. Hey, I, I was just looking um because we, uh you know, you guys were talking about Killing Joke. Troy, did you get one of these? First of all, no. What the hell is that? This is the official Killing Joke book that came out in two thousand twenty-one. I still haven't even seen that documentary that Sean Pettigrew did. Yeah, well, no, I, I, I haven't. I haven't seen that documentary either. My gal was saying like, I got. We need to watch it. I, I got to get on it. Yeah. I'm flipping through here, Troy, because there's a whole page <laughs> with you, just you, devoted to you. Oh, my God. And my it's, God. it's got a big picture. Oh, and no. Do I want to see it? But one thing I should add to what's really great is they encouraged my wife coming on a tour. She came out mid through the tour. It's funny. When I went to pick her up at the airport, I was at the bar with fish from Aurelian, and the first person off the, off the plane was George Clinton. Really strange. And... <laughs> But yeah, that whole thing. So when Laura was, I was like a vacation and jazz like that. He goes, if it's just all men, it's just like you got young boys. So he probably there you go. go Dick, oh, my, you. oh my God. Wow. So this is your official, um, official, official. Don't fuck with me. I was in killing joke moment. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Well, that's hey, what hey, I think. Hey, do me a favor. Do me a favor. Yes. Take, a, take a screenshot of that and, and send it to me so I can send it to Paul Bear. <laughs> right. Right. And I love sheer terror again. I don't want to be harmed when I go down to the battery electric. <laughs> oh, you're done now, bro. I, I never go to Mark, Mark Newman's house and, and watching, uh, visiting Mark Newman and, and his girlfriend and watching for some reason Kindergarten Cop. That was the last time I saw Mark Newman, I think. Yeah. Nice. From yeah, I gotta watch that. I gotta watch that killing. Have you seen that killing joke, Doc Joel? Yeah. Is it good? I, I've only seen the trailer, man. Uh, it. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's very jazz. And okay. you know what I mean when I say that? Yeah, I know um, what you mean when you say that. But it's got a lot of the, um, you know, the cast of characters are all in there. 
Um, the funny thing is, is, you know, Raven, too, we haven't brought because Raven I was friendly with. When they came around with Murder, Inc. and stuff in New York when I was with Prong, you know, I hung out with him. And it was really funny. It was like um, I, the last well, killing joke with Ted Parsons playing with him. I was in New York playing with the Volbeats at uh, my first CMJ thing. And when we got done playing, someone was like, oh, you going to see Killing Joke. I'm like, we're in town? I'm like, yeah. So I went, walked down the street. I go under a huge line. I walk up to the room up front. And I'm just like, I don't have any money. And I was coming out there to play the show. So I was out there working. And I'm like, I know this sounds stupid, but I was in this band before. And I'm in town. I didn't know it was any way I could get the road manager. She was like, you know what? I actually believe you're going in. And then I found the same sound man that we had. And I'm like, hey, who's playing drums? And he's like, oh, guy named Ted Parsons. I'm like, oh, core, right. You know what I mean? So, and, and, but then I walk upstairs and open the door and Jordy sees me. And I did this televised gig playing bass for Electric Six not too long before that. But he turns around and goes, you're an Electric Six now. And I'm like, no, I was just, it was just a gig type of thing. And I hung out them now night, but Ted Parsons, um, Paul Raven, me, um, Al Kissy's, they went to this bar afterwards and we, and, Stayed there all night. It was ridiculous. I got in a cab. I don't. Re I don't remember. I didn't remember how to get back to my hotel where I was staying with the Bull Beats and stuff. And it was, but it was so much fun. And that was the last time I saw Raven. And Raven was, I sorry, I talked so much shit about you when I joined Prong. And he was, you know, it's all. I'm like, I know. I go. I I've already been spent time on Killing Joke. I know how you guys are. You'll talk shit about each other, but at the same time, you'll punch someone else who does, yeah. and that you absolutely love each other. So it's it's go interesting. Ahead, since we're, doing the, we're chopping it up about Killing Joke, I got to make a quick little like small world thing. I realized, Troy, watching this show, um, you and I both did Pig Face with Atkins, who was in Killing Joke. But to bring it back further than that, full circle, on the new Pig Face live album, I'm pretty sure Mike Alonzo plays on that, too. Oh, right on. Martin yeah. Atkins is a super cool cat. I, I, I played, joined him on stage in... Um, Played like his floor tom and I brought a harmonica and then and then um what's his name Terrence from Thrill Kill Cult really tall guy like oh, Charles Charles Lee Charles Bell. so sorry uh but he hands me his bass to play and he's super tall and he plays it like Didi Ramon Low so I mean it was like down to my ankle that was a fun night it's an Ann Arbor blind fit right yeah I've been talking to Martin Atkins a long time he was uh um Joel Blaze. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being part of today's show. That's right, Billy. You did. I see that. Yeah, you have you have to come by more often. I, I really enjoy when I wasn't on the screen when I, when I could like I, I could like I really did I really enjoy it, man. Like like just producing the show. Uh, anybody you want to shout out, Joel or Blaze, on this Sunday? I I don't have anybody. Well, maybe Bones. Shout out. You got to shout out to Bones, our buddy Bones. <laughs> yeah. Shout it out loud. <laughs> and uh, Drew, always good seeing you. Troy, love you to death. You know, I love that. you too. It's so wonderful to see you. And it was really nice to meet you as well. Nice okay. meeting you guys. I'll and talk to you soon, Joe. All right, guys. Take care. Love you both. See you later, Blaze. Ciao, ciao, ciao. That was Bye. cool, huh? Yeah. So I'm trying to roll cigarettes. I'm really bad at them. I'm just trying to yeah, cut yeah, down. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to take a sponsor break now. Okay, um, cool. And we'll come back. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about the new material that you just put out. And we'll take some questions from around the world, okay? Great. Thank you. Well, there you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, often imitated, never duplicated. We are sponsored by blah, 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 and Grunge and Grime Soap Company. They're a handmade soap and skincare company with a rock and roll spirit. Based in Smashville, Tennessee, Tennessee, they combine their love for rock music. I love rock music in Tennessee. And their love for creating products that are good for your skin and good for your soul. Since the year of our God, 2019, they have been creating high quality, natural handmade soaps and skincare products with ethically sourced and sustainable ingredients. They give 10% of the net proceeds to local and community outreach programs. Visit the website at www.grungeandgrime.com and enter the code DREW, D-R-E-W, and get 20% off your first order. Come on now, the Texas Silver Rush is a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. Goddamn electric. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces as well as style them for stage, album covers, promo photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock Roll Hall of Famers Greg Rollet, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. 
Information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram pages. And, of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Last but not least on today's show, DTFM Vinyl Distro is a record store that specializes in underground music, punk, ska, hardcore, metal, and more. Located in the heart of Fargo, North Dakota's Industrial District, shop in person or online at www.dtfmvinyldistro.com, where the motto is death to false metal. Um, that said, uh, if you're still wondering, how can I can I love this show, and I want to support it. Fear not, my friend. There is a Patreon page. Uh, there's also a PayPal if you want to make a, a contribution. There's a super chat. Uh, we're doing questions now. So uh, if you have a que- if you have a question, uh, feel free to post up your question. Um, shout out to Flotzilla. Not sure where Flotzilla is. Is that a place, Flotzilla? Um, oh, you know what? You know what we didn't do? You know what we have not done? Fear not, because we're going to do it now. The next four shows. We have not done the next four shows. Coming up, there. You know what? There's going to be a little a little break in shows um, since we we are playing out west next weekend, and there is no show Wednesday. This is, I think we've done this once before, where there was this uh, long a break in between shows. Um, you know, we come back strong, but so we'll be back uh, a week from Wednesday. That's Wednesday, October twelfth, with Adam Sewell. Uh, author, artist, manager, um, very interesting character. He was in Monster Voodoo Machine, Def Con Sound System. Uh, then a week after that, Robbie Steve Davidson, formerly of The Exploited and Billy Bio. He has a new film out um, that we're going to talk about. Uh, Sunday, October 23rd, Chris and Eddie from Powerhouse. And then our Halloween show on Sunday, October 30th with Damien uh, and Joe Truck. From Brain Eaters, of course, Damien was also in Sam Hain. You know, I want to mention, I I, I posted this the other day on um, social media. Uh, Coming up, this is is one that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, An old friend, a band that influenced me quite a bit. Uh, Sunday, November 20th, Chris Foley from SSD Control or SSD will be on the show. He was the drummer in, in, in SSD. Um, it's nice to get some of the different voices, uh, what we like to do on the show. You know, sure, you know, we have the usual suspects. Hey, SSD Control, Al Burrell, Jamie. Yo, we're going to have Chris Foley on the show, and this is going to be very cool. This is a guy that you never hear from, and he played on, you know, uh, the kids will have their say and get it away. He played on all the SSD control records. And I want to announce a show here. Uh, this is a show that has not been announced uh, anywhere as of yet. On s- Wednesday, November 30th, New York Hardcore represent R.B. Corbett will be on the show. Uh, e- from Even Worse, Highly Effective People. Lately, she's been playing in the Bush Tetras. Old school New York hardcore gal. She was there, uh, you know, and even worse with Jack Rabbit. Uh, so we always like having gals on the show. And uh, and here you go, uh, R.B. Corbett. That said, uh, post your questions. This is it, question time. Everybody that was carrying on about this or that, uh, let's bring our guest back on, Mr. Troy Gregory. Hey, man. Okay, here's one. Let's 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 kick off with this. Hey, Troy, any memories of opening for King Diamond in 1988 when you were in Flotsam? I yeah. saw that tour at the Showcase in Comac, New York. Uh, used to be Lamore Far East. Any, you remember? Oh, I remember that tour. That was, we were on that tour a long time. It was, it was like almost a three-hour a three hour tour. I right? know, a three-month tour. <laughs> and um, it, it was, his bands were really party guys. Those like the, the type of musicians that know like strippers in every town, that type of thing. Mickey D was the drummer. Oh yeah, okay. a, a, a hilarious, a gas. Andy sure. Lorraine on sure. guitar. Oh, what's the other guy's name? Hal, I think was the name of the bass player. I know Hal. I'm thinking of 2001. But but anyways, King Diamond and I got along very well. As I said, I, I 
when it comes to like theology and occult stuff, I, I just have an interest in it, you know, any Gnostic, you know, Gnostic things as well. And especially around that time. And I would talk to him about like, you know, things like that. And he's like, you know so much about it. And I never mentioned it, but how I saw Zena LaVey on something. I thought she was cute. And he goes, oh, you like Zena? When, <laughs> when we were in LA, I'll set you up with her. So he's going to set me up with the daughter of the Church of Satan. Um, <laughs> but what the funny thing is, is we, there was one time there was a big boy across from the hotel. And it was like, um, it, was in, it was in Massachusetts because there was that candlestick bowling, right? Is that what they call it? Candlestick bowling? Like little bowling, like bowling alleys where they're like really tiny. Duck, and, and duck, pin, duck No, no. I think there is candle. I I remember duck pin bowling where the 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 pins are small and the ball fits in your hand. I, think, I remember it as duck pin bowling, but it might be known as candlestick oh. bowling. Well, I hope I'm not imagining it. But anyway, yeah, no. Dorian James says duck pin. Yeah, I remember it as duck pin bowling. But go ahead. But go King, ahead. King Diamond and I, uh, we really bonded over like um, he just got to a record store. Me and him was sitting at the big boy. And um, he showed me what he got. When about Alice Cooper, we got to talk about Alice Cooper, you know, especially Alice Cooper band. Because actually, uh, you know, it's like that's one of my favorite groups, actually, that when I was sure. growing up, especially Hello Hooray. And just as a kid, I mean, I was Alice Cooper for Halloween, everything, you know, um, that, but also about Genesis and Peter Gabriel with them and with his the, the, the theatrical stuff. I love that era. And so did he. And it was funny, though, because I wouldn't call my mom and I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm like in Boston. Um, yeah, I'm a big boy with King Diamond. <laughs> it just sounded funny. It was like, like a few years back, I was with the Dirt Bums and we were going to have lunch with the other band we were playing with, the Trashman. Original guys, except for one, was one of the guy's sons in it. But as I was calling my wife, I'm like, I got to go and have lunch with the Trashman now, which was really cool and cool. Is that right? That's an interesting, uh, the current drummer of Flotsam, Ken Mary, used to be in Alice Cooper. This is another weird thing about Ken Mary, though. Ken Mary was in a band with Scott Earl. Or knew Scott Earl, uh, the guy that I went with the metal, with the guy who had the Metallica audition. Oh wow! And I met Ken Mary through Scott. I don't know if Ken Mary remembers this because Kip Winger was playing bass. We I, we went to those dress rehearsals for two nights for Alice Cooper, and he had that uh, Kane Roberts guy. Yeah, and I know like that. Yeah. yeah, I know Kane. Super nice because you know I, it's he's, he's a nice guy. I yeah, because at first I, I must admit. You know, I, I, it's always horrible. Cast of Spears and that people I saw him like, you know, the Ramblin thing. I'm like, oh, God, that's cool. But then afterwards, we're talking, and he's so super nice. And he knew that I was like this kind of poor kid living there, living on ramen noodles. And they had this whole spread, and he packed it all up for me and, and gave it to me really sweet. And I met, and Alice was in line for getting food, like in front of me, or getting in line for getting a drink. And I'm like, I gotta say something. I'm like, excuse me, uh, Alice. And he turns around and goes, yeah, I'm my name's Troy. Uh, I'm from Detroit. And I did the same thing with Iggy. And he's like, He's like, yeah, yeah. And, then, and I'm like, I got a place. And I'm like, where'd you hang out in, when you're in Detroit? He goes, Northland Mall, which is really strange. Uh, let's, 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 get, before I just want, I want to, before, there's a lot of good questions. So let's try to bang through a couple of them. But here's, of course, me and, me and King Diamond back in the day. He's a super Europe. nice guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's, he's nice. great, man. He, yeah, he, I really he, liked him. King is great, man. Good, good. Fun yeah, don't, don't break the oath. If someone came from another planet and said, yeah. what's metal sound like? I would just play that movie. Don't break I, the oath. I, I love those freaking King uh, King Diamond records, them and like I love those records. Anyway, yeah. um, he, let's. Um, boy, what the hell? Uh, how about you know what I want? Let's go with this for a second. The Dillinger Compound's been very patient the whole show. Two questions, if possible, Drew. What's your relationship with Ted Parsons now? Tommy says he wanted to reunite the Beg to Differ era prong for a reunion. Yes, I believe he did. And Michael Kirkland got very ill. They got back in touch with him as well. Um, and when for a short time, I was on Facebook when all that shit started, more MySpace, one of those things, and we talked for a bit. But uh, Ted, I was with the Dirt Bombs in Oslo, Norway, where he lives. And I just happened to have to ask the opening band, you guys know who Ted Parsons is? It turns out one of the guys goes, oh, that's one of my mates. And I call, and I get his number, I called him, and he was watching his children. And Ted had some horrible health issues as well. I actually think that he was, you know, kind of at the door, as they say. And so, so, so the reality of is the real the reality of it is chances are it would be hard to put to, it would be hard to reunite that lineup. He, well, he got better, oh. and he, he got us. You know, I, I believe didn't always kind of keep in contact with him, but you know, message every now and then. I know he's very busy there, and he really likes his life there. I don't really know how. His and Tommy's relationship split sure. after I, I didn't really. 
best okay. in that. But um, but yeah, Ted, you know, it's that's you know, he's a funny laid back yeah. guy, you know. I want to I would like to have seen him that night. Okay. Hey, I got a shout out from Serbia who just signed on. Uh Serda and Hardy. Oh, I love from Serbia. Serbia. Th thanks for thanks for checking in and, and we're shouting out a Sunday shout out day. We're shouting we're, we're shouting out all our friends in, in Serbia. Um Let's say, you know, so let, let, let me, let me, let me uh, segue this here. So RS70 says, is he making any new music? And hold on. Um, Sonny, which says, Troy, the new albums are brilliant. Will, will there be videos for any of the, uh, for the new songs? And let me, let, let's, let's touch on the new albums. Let me, let me put them up because. I know. Here's here's one of them. This is uh, so you you just you just put out three new releases: uh, Sand Dollar Castle, heroically versed in complex ecosystems, which this is the cover for, yes. and the Carnival Crowd. So yes. the answer to is, is he putting out new music? Is it yes? Just yes. Yesterday, right? Yes. Yesterday. You put out three uh, new albums. Give us a little perspective on them, please, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll put up the covers. Yeah, I, um, over, uh, well, I, over COVID, I just you know, wrote a lot more, and just, and, but I didn't like anything I was doing. I went through this horrible dry spell. But then I kind of went back and realized I actually did some things I enjoyed. That's the cover of Sandower Castle. Um, and I don't really, you know, in staying, I don't do much anyways, even pre-COVID, other than work on things and try to spend time with Laura and, and my cat and just take her walks. I love yeah. this cover. I love this cover, bro. This is the cover to the carnival crowd, right? Oh, they go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like, I like this and, one a lot, man. So they, um, so I was working on it. These are all done by myself. I did a record before that called Xaviera. It's a double album and it's only four songs or so three right. minutes aside, and that was just me, and a super birthday record called Africa. I, I listened to it too. while I was making dinner last night. Oh, good, it's good and, background and, music. Uh, yo, it's four songs, like thirty minutes each. Yeah, I really love playing that, and so I put together this band's super birthday to play that live, and did a record called Africa Pocus with that. Even though it's just me playing everything, and we've been playing, we played shows for it, but during the COVID, it kind of it, you know, it dispelled when the guys went back to get his um, engineering masters. And stuff, and then another guitar player uh, reformed the Witches with me, and um, which is a band I did for years. But this is um, this is part of a trilogy, and yes, there will be videos because I'm working with Unreal Engine and Blender um, right now, and um, creating those this, these stories that go with it. And there actually is um, about eighty percent done on four other records. Okay. So I'm, but I figure I might wait. Actually, I want to ask your opinion, and maybe uh, you got a lot of people here. I don't know what to do because I do have more stuff and I most likely I'm going to release it now because I just want mm -hmm. to. Um, and I want people to hear it. Um, I like that sharing with them. I don't want to get all spooky. Um, but um, I don't know, should I release them as records or one at a time like singles? Because I, I figured maybe, I thought maybe when I finished the song, I guess I could just put it up as a single. I only have it on Bandcamp right now. I haven't done that whole aggregator shit well, well, on Spotify it, it, and all that that's crap. A, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question because you don't want to overwhelm you know, you, you, people and drown them in stuff. But then on the other hand, like you want to give them something to bite on. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough call. I mean, it, we're, it, we're, we're, we're in the studio. We're doing a, a full-length 12, 12 songs. But that's us. We're, we're coming out of the gate. Uh, but, you know, I, I'd, say, I'd say put out – Oh, Darren says singles first. That's singles first? Says. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, and yeah, then you know, our friend, our new friend, Dildra Compounds, some bands are doing EPs. EPs seem to be, in the world we live in now with streaming, it mm -hmm. seems like four song EPs, you know, like six song EPs. That that seems, Dorian says one at a time. I'm so, certain, you know, my, my wife suggested that as well, and she's usually yeah. right with me. And so, so it, it's... Uh, it's interesting because the witches uh, I got a whole record written for them. Um, I wouldn't do that with the whole band because you know after doing all these records by myself, you also want to work with other people. I realize how much I miss being with people and having their ideas as well, and not always mine. And, Here's a good one. Uh, excuse me. Uh, from Violent Time, Vi Violet Times. Excuse me. Can you talk about Mick Collins joining the Dirt Bombs, etc., please? Oh yeah, Mick. Mick is funny because I met him at a, like he's at these record convention type things. I mean, like a VFW hall. People selling their promos and bootlegs and stuff, and 
everything like that. Like, you know, I buy like some like the damned from like, uh, you know, 1978 somewhere or something, you know, record things that of course were illegal. But uh, I met Mick like back then and uh, and then they had this friend Monica Chanel was always trying to get us together when I moved back to Detroit and he was doing the Gories. And we uh, had a, this guy, Jim Diamond, had this studio they moved to, uh, called Ghetto Recorders in Detroit. And we became friends. He actually even played with the Witches for a while as well. And actually, Mick even played with the Witches uh, a couple shows and appeared on one of the records. But he um, started to be doing a band of Dirt Bombs and it was always a rolling thing. So he'd be like, hey, can you come in? So over a period of 15 or so years, I played almost every instrument in that band. I played first on just a cover of Eno's um, King's Lead Hat. I played violin on it. And um, then fuzz bass, then bass. We actually just played with them two two months ago or so. Actually, in July, we played out the Mosswood Meltdown in Oakland that John Waters hosted with uh, also Bikini Kill played too. So uh, he lives in New York now. But Mick and I, we roomed together on tour and probably the best tour roommate I've had. Very, you know, we go back and people go, where's the party? He's like, well, I'm reading the book. And I was editing my film and, um, um, and stuff in the hotel room. So we had no party going out in here. So um, we talked, actually, he, he called me last night and um, sent some text asking me some question about some praying that that's, that was fighting something, if I remember. I don't remember. But uh, no, he's, he's, he's still a, a, a good a good friend. Good. And I, I like playing with uh, Dirt Bonds. I've only ever left the band to because something else was happening. Because again, another band where it's somebody else's thing, but Mick gives me a lot of you know, do what the hell you want and help me write. Problem is, is I helped them write. We did this uh, e split EP with King Khan and the Shrines, mm -hmm. the split record. And he wanted to do like, it was, I want to do more like something like, kind of like a uh, can or Faust on this one. And so I helped him write it too. And um, it got panned, like, uh, cause he had this garage rock following and they're just like, oh, this is a fucking one, they hit it. <laughs> oh, and they no. blamed to me. They're going, they got that Troy Gregory guy in the band. And every time he gets in a group, he makes their shittiest album. And then he always makes their weirdest album. And I was like, oh, great. And so he, the next record, I start, I got some ideas. He's, he's like, oh no, man, he was, he was, you got to take all the credit for that. He goes, I wanted them to blame me for that record, <laughs> you know? And it's like, all right. Let's but, talk uh, about, um, let's, so uh, the witches. Uh, is this is this safe to say that this is you know your personal vehicle? Yes. Um. The only actually in that picture, uh, Mary, uh, the woman to my uh, right, she's the only member that's still in the band. Um, okay. Actually, wait, that drummer, wait, drummer, wait, 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 that wait, drummer about, never even got to play a show. He had got a hernia, and then eventually I got another drummer. How about this one? Oh, yeah, Better. Better. Um, Eugene, right there, you see in the front uh, with the flower shirt. I'm in the uh -huh. back there. Um. He's in the band. He joined around Universal Mall. Uh, Craig, who I'm uh, the guy the far right, I'm actually working on writing a film with. Stefan, the other day, I ran into at the Blondie Dan show and asked me if he needed, uh, needed any instrumentation. And that dog, unfortunately, Bones, died. And I ended the witches when Bones died for a while. And it's always a thing I thought I mentioned. That's from recently, a place yeah. called Valero, about a couple of months ago. So I got Matthew Lanou from, um, uh, who, he's played with the Bon Bondies and, um, Nice device, and he played with me in Super Birthday. And Eugene, Mary asked playing keyboards and drums, Claudia, Veronica, Leo. She used to be the drummer for the Avatars, and she and uh, Rail Ryan, and she wrote, um, she ran a record label. She's from uh, South America. She wrote, uh, ran a record label called No Fun Records, a lot of garage rock and punk and stuff like that, and she's on drums. And we just kind of organically formed it. I just wanted to be around people who I missed and wanted to hang out with, and it never, and Gene had like, kind of been in a band. And it's just, again, it was wanting to be in a creative situation where I wasn't, it wasn't all me. It was, again, yeah. it was, I think I said it before, it was like, sure. you're making a self-portrait, then it's nice to make a mural because I'm always, I like being surprised in here and stuff. It's I, nice I, mean, to, I, it's, I can relate to it. It's nice, yeah. to, it's nice to collaborate uh, with people, you know, every now, now and then. Yeah, it's um, very much a social thing more than, hey, we're going to take over the world and do this. It's, I want to record a record and yes, I would love to make some money. I'd love to tour with it. But it's right now, it's just to be with friends and playing. And we got a bunch of shows next uh, this month, which we're so excited about. Like we're playing the Theater Bazaar, which is a big, nice. huge masquerade ball thing that goes on in Detroit. People come out for and um, and uh, playing a uh, play things called Echo Fest. It's like a psychedelic kind of freak out sure. kind of thing. And yeah, so um, we're playing. It's fun. Cool. Uh, Chucky uh, Chucky Brown, the singer for Crazy Eddie, and in, in one of our. Uh big supporters and, and, and music historians asks, and you, and you did touch on it earlier in the show, 
meeting Joey uh, Castillo, the drummer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I believe he, Troy, co-wrote two tracks on the Wasted Youth Black Days album. Yeah, um, it's funny because Joe, uh, Rick, Rick Suckum sent me a thing and said, sorry about that. And I talked to Joel, Joey about that one time after he was playing Danzig. It was one of the last times I saw him in person, I believe. And uh, we got along great. I mean, he's funny. I remember it was funny because there was this woman I, I knew that came from Detroit that came out and visited me. They all thought I liked her, but it was, you know, she was just a friend. And um, she started hanging out with this guy who was from Detroit who was in a TV show called The New Monkeys. Do you remember that? The New yep. Monkeys? Yep. Right. And he was this guy from Detroit. His name is Dino. I didn't really know him real well. He might have been a nice guy. I have no idea. But it's funny because I remember like talking about it. And uh, there was that Among the Living came out from an Anthrax. Joey Castillo, he saw his go around going, the monk, the monk. The Dino <laughs> is the monk. You know, he's the monk. And it's, you know, it's just, I, don't know, I just remember that about Joey. It was really funny. I remember they took me to a place called Funky Reggae. It was Oslo. It was a place to tame me down. Used to run with Ricky Rackman. They would also call it. Um, so oh, that's the cat, cat house. house? Cat, cat house. house. Yeah. yeah. And then some other nights, it, and other nights it wasn't like that. It was more. It was like a, like a lot of reggae and house. Yeah, stuff. it was on. It was on La Brea. Yeah. So I could still see in my head. I could see Joey on the dance floor dancing in this funky reggae, the funky reggae. Yeah. That's everything. And yeah, I, I, it's funny because I saw it was the last season of Twin Peaks. I think it was Nine Inch Nails and seeing him on drums. It's just cool. It's, you know, the, yeah. so you've got someone that you're friends with that, you know, I, I, if I ever run into him again, whoever knows, but, you know, good on him, you know. Um, just just because Melanie's been so patient the whole show. Grew up with the Flotsam Reich boys. Troy was great addition and accepted that girls could appreciate music and not be a fucking band-aid. It's good to now complete my list of seeing friends from BITD, I'm not sure what that means. Back in the day. Back in the day. Thank you. <laughs> I just guessed that. Sorry. So <laughs> glad you're living your dream. Rest in peace, oh, Chris Crutcher. Tech for Flots and Prong gone too soon. Yeah, that's I said. It, it's a, he was a friend of theirs that came out on the tour. And he actually sure. did my bass tech, which I'm the easiest person to do it before because I changed my own springs, anyways, and I like carrying my equipment. Yeah. Which we used to piss off killing joke techs. It's your music. You're not supposed to touch that, you know. And, right, right. And I'm like, I've been changing strings since I was a kid. I'd man. be scared to piss off anybody in that camp, man. Well, yeah, but it's like, uh, yeah, you know. Hey, let's okay. let's <laughs> let's bring it let's bring it full circle um, as we wrap it up. Uh, tarot deck, uh, tarot deck that you put out. Well, I even put it out. I made it. Tell tell us about I, it. I, I'm I'm interested in such a thing. I um. Well, I've always wanted to make one, but I wanted to do one that was kind of unique. Um, so I kind of, it's a little bit Marseille, it's a little bit pop, and it's a little bit Rider away, but it's all, and a little bit of uh, none of that. And I wanted to do, and I did do, but I don't like the stuff right now. I made a piece of music for each card. Wow. And, um, and, I, and all different things, like this was more of a painting of my Fool Punch. That's one of my oh, favorites, because the Fool's supposed to be going, and every card... Someone tells you to make a tarot deck. They always say you have to have the fool is heading, you know, he should, he should be going the other way. But yep. I thought he's yep. the fool. So my deck, he's, he's going fool. the other way. He's not doing <laughs> it. And the dog is more pertinent than him, who's way down there and all the shit. Awesome. Show me another one. And, um, okay. Um, here's my my lover. Nice. The sweet, wow, the sweet, these, are really, these are really cool. The sweethearts are called the nest. Um, and then there's like ones that are more like kind of drawings like well my devil which is scratch and everything so i sent out this card company to get them made up and i was going to do it and people asked if they were interested said that they were interested. you know our friend our good friend larry kelly who lives up in salem says really bring some up bring some up my way i just figured it was after the COVID. i just didn't i didn't want to try to because i to get more cards made i'd have to get a lot of orders i'm not a good salesman and the idea of Getting that and asking people for money when things were hard on everybody, you know, it was like fuck, man. It was not yeah. terrible that for me right now. So, and at this point, I sat with it. I made up two hybrids. I only have two that exist. Very cool. And I want to redo it. I think everyone's saying, "Show the hangman." Can we see the oh. hermit? Every, everybody oh, the her wants to see this and that. Well, it's a, yeah. okay. The hermit. Well, it's the lone wolf. Oh, sorry. Oh wow, that's cool. These are great, man. Thank you. 
and um, awesome. Hangman is it's not one of my favorites, but it, it, here he is. Oh, wait, other way. Sorry. Oh, I see. And I, I just well, it I, depends on how you draw it, right? <laughs> yeah, and some and some of these were done with three D models and messed with, and yeah, it was all the synthesis for that, you know. And it was it was interesting to make. I really have always enjoyed them. And when the Dirt Bombs, we played a festival um, not too long ago in Belgium. And um, I went to this card company that was a card making company. And it just so happened to have a tarot, um, like early tarot um, display there. And it was really beautiful. It was really nice. And took pictures of like all the old, old grave, you know, the old engravings and stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, really nice. Yeah, we just, we just um, spent some time up in Salem, Mass. It was very enjoyable. That was the last uh, time I saw Joel Gosson in person. He came to a witches show there. Yeah. Oh, the witches, the witches, the witches played in Salem. Yep. Yeah. At this well, time there you go. Time well, there you go. It was, right? it was fun though. Yeah. You can't beat that with a baseball bat, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, listen. I want to thank you for coming on the show. I really, sure. I really enjoyed it, man. I, 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 I really enjoyed it, and I uh, enjoyed talking to you too. I loved to talk about some other things as well. You know, at some yeah. point, um, especially I like to get by more film stuff with you uh, of stuff that you're doing you know yeah. i'm getting yeah, started like we, another film and i'll be doing these cartoons or these an cartoons animations for all these songs and everything and releasing and i appreciate uh, people chiming in on that about releasing now at this point one at a time a tune well i know i know I, I know you did uh you, world war love right yeah it's up on it's online it's not that great but it was one of those films that i from doing it I learned what not to do for making a film. There's some good performances in it from some mm -hmm. people. I used a lot of people from other bands, like Mick Collins is in a scene. He's a uh, co from the Dirt Bombs as well. And um, you know, Nathaniel Mayer, an old R&B artist I toured with and played with. Uh, we did a record with Dan, Dan from the Black Keys. Oh, right me, on. Me and uh, uh, Matt Smith. We did two records with Nate, and then he passed away. He was great live because we play his stuff how it is. But then we would just take it off and it would sound like freaking Hawkwind or combined with like, uh, you know, the cigarettes or something like that. You know what I've been to cigarettes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, Spur Spur Spurzo, the, the Spiral Space Wolf says, hey, Troy, what's up, brother? Oh, he's from the Blue Black Hours. He's a oh, bass right? from the Blue Black Hours from Detroit. They're a good band. I know. Anybody you want to shout out? Anybody you want to thank? Just anyone who just actually sat up in here, you know, I haven't been very social um just been very positive everyone seems been very nice and i just everyone you know uh billy i've seen in a while and i think there was someone on i think sunny witch is yeah. this woman named kim who actually has a witch's tattoo on her on her leg that she showed me my wife in, in tempe um i believe um i, I just everybody sunny sunny nice. witch sunny witch was the like when we when i yeah. Came, when I came on air today, she was the first person in the chat room. So she was definitely looking forward. Yes, thanks, Troy, she said. Yeah. I know she was a Prong yeah. fan. And, um, right. and yeah, just, it just, that's really nice. You know, I, yeah, I just, yeah, you're right. I, yeah. I, I even don't really like to use the word fan. It's just so weird because it almost adds like this idea of then of this idea of adoration. I really like, I think that's why I'm more, I want to push more for the animations because you got that out there rather than my puss, you know, yeah. and, um, I, I, I like that, but it's always felt that when you're performing in the evening, it's I always hate when bands go, "Come on, audience, because you know, lighten up, and show." You know, it's like, no, it's your job. You're the background of someone's evening. They're there that night with a friend. They might be there alone. They might have lost. You don't know what's going on with them, but they're there that evening, and you're all part of it. And I always thought that for band members too, from the bartenders to everybody who works there, that you're all working together that night. I always hated musicians that come in and act like, "Now we own this place." People come say, "I always." really can't um stand that you know yeah. you're back on the song's evening and that's great especially if they stay and you think about it you think all the shows you went to bring up you remember mostly also who you were with and other things that happened that evening and so you're just part of it i don't even care if anyone pays total attention you know it's just you're the soundtrack of their evening and i, I think that's groovy same thing with even about the music clean the house go to sleep whatever you do with music that's fine you know yeah. it's you're, you're just you're that and you provide that kind of service for me personally it's art yes i feel i am one of those jerks that please that it is art for me and because it is yeah and right. uh, but it is fun and work too yep well thank yeah. you man thank you um, so much i appreciate me rambling listen it, it, uh, i enjoyed it you know it, it 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 it's 
for me, shows like this are very enjoyable. You know, uh, the, the, the straight up Vinny Stigma, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Roger Moret, you know, uh, Jimmy Gestapo, New York hardcore shows are great. You know, but I, I like I like getting out a little bit and, 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 and uh, learning and meeting new artists and, and, and doing research on them and, and just seeing, uh, you know, who tunes in from around the world and people who a lot. What I love, one of the things I love about doing a show like this is it brings a lot of new people to the party. And mm -hmm. it means a lot to, to me that they enjoy it. So there you go. One question before I leave. Is DRI a hardcore band? Are you asking me personally? Everybody. Are they? To me, they're not. No. To me, DRI is a is a is a crossover. I would call them a crossover band, which which is a or a thrash band. You see, I mean, just for me personally, me personally, I'm a first wave American hardcore dude, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I saw Minor Threat in the back in the day in the Bad Brains. So for yeah. me, hard hardcore is Minor Threat, Bad Brains, early Black Flag you know, negative approach. Right. That's why I started going to shows at the Greystone in Detroit. And NA was playing there in Necros as well. Yeah, yeah. Seeing, DRI, DRI crossover thrash. I used to see like, it's all like scratch acid there and kill those yeah. I really enjoyed yeah. to decroit and you saw us come around and play. But Farquhar, really, I would like do that discharge, hear nothing, see nothing, say nothing in record. What, what, why? That was the record I liked. Ain't no yeah. feeble bastard, no fucking scapegoat. That one, or yeah, yeah, yeah. sign of enormous door. That, that, that was that was a big record, man. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it. I, okay, just, oh, but I, then again, we didn't talk about any hardcore. So I figured your listeners are hardcore. Maybe we should talk hardcore too. But at, at Inkle, um, at Inkle 1987 says early DRI is definitely hardcore. You know, you know. That's, I, that's what I'm talking about. The deal yeah, with the yeah, record yeah. and Dirty Rotten LP. They're only two I had. I hated the crossover. I, mean, I saw DRI play. I saw DRI really. play the first time they played New York at a CBGB's hardcore matinee. And their set list ran down the wall and onto the floor. It was, <laughs> it was like 80 songs or something. I saw yeah. them open up with Slayer. It was, they were the only band that didn't get booed. It was Slayer and Metal Church. It was in L.A. It was for Rain and Blood. Yep. Heg says Violent Pacification was 1982 and definitely hardcore. I agree with that. Same as COC. They were, a punk, they were a punk hardcore first. Yeah. Yeah, I never seen them when it was just the three-piece yeah. in Detroit. Uh, Mike Dean. Yeah. And everything. Cool. So, anyways, All right. Well, let, let's talk soon, Troy. Thank you very much. I hope so. Take care. All right. Okay. Bye bye. All Thank right. you, everyone. Hey, take care of yourself in Detroit, man. All of my records are on, well, records, around Bandcamp. Yeah. So, not records, my digital versions of the thing for now on Bandcamp if you want to listen to them, please. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Right. Well, there you go. Today's guest was the one, the only Troy Gregory. Uh, great guest. I uh, really enjoyed it. Nice seeing a lot of new people uh, watching the show today. Um, that was fantastic. So uh, welcome, and I hope everybody comes back. And, uh, yes, thank you, Paulie. Uh, I know you were excited about today's show. Paulie, Paulie huge uh, Flotsam fan. Uh, Gary, thanks for stopping by, man. Uh, of course, Heggs, you know, um, we did questions, man. Where were you? We just did questions. Uh, Drew, are you good in that hurricane? Yes, I'm good. We we are down in Delray Beach, and uh, we were not hit uh, uh, per se by the hurricane, although a tornado landed uh, pretty much right across the street and turned a couple cars over. Yes, Larry Kelly, Mr. Wolf. Uh, he was a great guest, and it was nice. It was nice to talk about some different stuff. Thank you, John in London. Appreciate it, man. Um, yes. It was a good one. So I'm not going to see you guys for a minute. Um, we'll be back on uh, Wednesday, October 12th with Adam Sewell. And then uh, on Sunday, October 23rd with the Powerhouse guys. So lots coming up. If you're out on the, in the Northwest, Incendiary Device is playing Saturday in Seattle. And Sunday we're playing Crash Fest in uh in portland and uh we're really looking forward uh we're, listen if you're gonna have withdrawals from the show join patreon because i'm going to be doing a, a patreon only show uh on wednesday next week and it should be interesting if you're toying with the idea please join patreon uh the show just needs support man that's just this is how we can do it it's how i can dedicate so much time energy and effort into this show uh yes thank you the show rules. I'm ruling. Uh, as, uh, uh, shouting out Robert Hogg uh, in Scotland, man. Hope you're well, buddy. 
I know this is the second time we've ever gone 10 days without a show, but I'm going to do a Patreon only show on Wednesday. So join Patreon, you bums, if you're not on there. Yes, dad's going in for hip replacement tomorrow. The one, the only Arnie Stone. Hopefully everything goes well. Uh, that's why we're down there. Yeah. Seattle, come on down, Melanie. We'll be there. Um, what else? Oh, I think we're good. Uh, once again, thanks a lot, everybody. Um, we'll see you when we see you. Until then, do good things. Oh. And good things will come to you. What?